The picture is called Liberty, and Liberty is just what Stan and Oliver have foremost on their minds. Written and directed by Leo McCary, this comedy was released in 1929, when Laurel and Hardy had reached their peak, and both the laughing 20s and the golden age of silent comedy were drawing to a close. Hello, hello. Who would have thought it? It's that time again. Time for another exciting installment of the Laurel and Hardy blogcast. As always, I'm your host, Patrick Vasey, the author of the Laurel and Hardy blog and the upcoming book, Laurel and Hardy Silence. And whether you meant to or not, you're listening to episode 26. So hold on to your hats, folks, as in this episode, we're getting high and dizzy as we focus on Stan and Babe's 28th film together. I'm talking, of course, about the wonderful Liberty. And I have to say, you're in for a real treat today, as we have not one, but two experts joining us. Coming up in the second half of the show is our regular special guest and friend of the podcast, Randy Scretvet. But before we climb the girders to meet Randy, we have to swap trousers with our first guest, locations expert, John Bengston. But before we jump into our getaway car and throw off our prison stripes, uh, I have to share this latest blogcast review left on Apple Podcasts with you. Uh, now, I've got to say, I absolutely love this review, so much so that I've used it uh, recently in some of my publicity materials. Um, the review was left by Kerr Lockhart, and for those of you who don't know Kerr, he is an actor, director, producer, and writer, and is also the co-host and co-producer of the Silent Film Music Podcast, alongside Ben Modell. So Kerr really knows his stuff, um, and his review of the blogcast reads, Stop reading this and start listening to this podcast now. You may not be aware of it, but the Laurel and Hardy blogcast was the reason podcasting was invented. All other podcasts, especially those true crime ones, may be discarded and ignored. This is the real deal. Most of the episodes are devoted to a single Laurel and Hardy film, in which host Patrick Vasey reads his blog post on that film, which saves you the hard work of reading, and then follows a conversation or two by such Laurel and Hardy experts as Randy Scretvet, Glenn Mitchell and Richard Bann. The treatment is affectionate, exhaustive, but fair and measured. Some of the films come in for some sharp criticism. As producer Vasey peppers the show with bumpers and inserts taken from Laurel and Hardy's soundtracks, as well as archival interviews with Stan Laurel and many of his associates, it is indispensable. I started by binging the first 25 episodes in a month, and I did not regret that at all. It's going to be hard to wait a month for each new one from now on. If you like Laurel and Hardy, you must listen. And if you don't like Laurel and Hardy, seek professional help, (laughs) Uh, which is fabulous. Thank you so much, Kerr. I have to say thank you, thank you, thank you for taking the time to leave that review. Um, It was such a joy to receive that, and it really does help to spur me on uh, to continue doing what I'm doing. A thousand thanks. Um, And finally, just a couple of bits of news. Uh, At the start of September, I attended the 30th anniversary event of the Laurel and Hardy in Wigan. Um, It was a really fun event, uh, and I was able to meet some fellow blogheads for the first time, um, including uh, Bill Bailey, Mike Jones, Gary Wynn Stanley, who was one of the organisers of the event, uh, and the wonderful Willie McIntyre. I was also spending the afternoon as well next to the brilliant John Uller, who is author of a fantastic book on Charlie Hall 2. Now, what was especially nice on the day was being able to show off a few chapters of my Laurel and Hardy Silence book. Um, And again, lots of excellent feedback. Uh, And it was great to see so many faces light up when they saw some of the really rare stills um, that are coming in the book. Um, And the final piece of news, you may recall uh, from the last episode uh, that I've just taken on the role of editor of the all-new Laurel and Hardy magazine. Uh, Well, the first issue was... Uh, posted out to subscribers at the start of September Um, and again feedback so far has been really really positive. Uh, Russell and I wanted to ask for more feedback if possible Uh, so if any of you have any uh, feedback any burning issues anything you'd like to see different anything any changes we could make uh, we'd really like to hear from you because we just want to make sure that we're getting the magazine right uh, for you Um, so all constructive feedback is much much appreciated. Uh, Links to subscribe to the magazine can be found in the show notes as usual um, and also uh, on the blogcast website which is laurelandhardyblog.com So that's all the news and reviews for today which means it's time to get into the good stuff. I hope you enjoy today's show. Just don't look down. Are you ready? All right, go! 
Today's film and focus is Liberty. Filmed October 1st to November 19th, 1928, it was released on January 26th, 1929. Produced by Hal Roach, directed by Leo McCary and James Horn, and photographed by George Stevens. Shortly after filming wrapped on We Four Down, Leo McCary made news by signing James Horn to a long-term contract to direct Hal Roach comedies. This was a significant recruitment for the studio, especially concerning Stan and Babe, as Horn would go on to direct some of Laurel and Hardy's best comedies, such as Big Business and Way Out West. He was immediately involved as an uncredited director in Laurel and Hardy's next picture, Liberty. With a good amount of quality material filmed and subsequently discarded from We Four Down, Stan, Leo McCary and their team of writers at the studio already had a solid start to their next project. The scenes of Stan and Ollie wearing each other's trousers and attempting to swap back were edited out of the previous comedy purely because of the film's length, but they were too good to remain on the cutting room floor. Their challenge, then, was to construct a story around them. Why were the boys wearing the wrong trousers, and what happened next? What resulted became one of Stan and Babe's best silent comedies, and one that is unique in their canon. The plot of Liberty is very simple. Stan and Ollie have escaped prison, and still in their prison stripes, they are fleeing from their jailers. The boys jump into the back of a pre-arranged getaway car, and they hastily discard their conspicuous prison garb, and begin to change into their trademark suits and derbies. It's not long before a police motorbike is hot on their tails, and the boys have to exit from their vehicle quickly. Both men leap from the moving vehicle, and they pretend to admire a parked car, until the motorbike cop tears past and is out of sight. As they emerge from behind the car and step onto the pavement, they soon realise they're wearing each other's trousers. That is all the plot required to make a hilarious two-reel comedy, with the remainder of the picture taken up with the boys attempting to swap trousers. Each time the boys attempt to make the switch discreetly, they're discovered by an unsuspecting passerby. They try to hide behind a stack of boxes, only for it to suddenly descend below street level on a hydraulic lift. Stan and Ollie are left exposed, trousers around their ankles, and watched with much suspicion by a cop. They give the cop the slip by trying somewhere more private, the back of a parked taxi cab. Typically, however, a young couple attempts to climb in, and the boys are again foiled. They must embarrassingly climb out of the cab, buttoning up their trousers and looking very coy. Interestingly, the young female is played by Jean Harlow, in only her fourth film role and her first with Stan and Babe. The next place the boys try is behind a fish shop. They squeeze in between some crates containing fish and crustaceans, and Ollie unwittingly knocks a live crab into the seat of Stan's pants. Just then, shop worker Harry Bernard appears, and the boys have to quickly hoist up their trousers and move along, leaving Harry wondering what they were doing. Another noteworthy moment in the film is the return of James Fenlison. After the success of Hats Off, Finlayson's last movie with Stan and Babe, James understood that his status in the team would be reduced from being an equal third of a Laurel, Hardy and Finlayson trio to that of an occasional supporting player. Understandably, he decided to move away from the Roach Studios to seek work in feature films at other studios such as First National and Fox. A little over a year later, James was back on the Roach lot and secured his place in film history as one of Laurel and Hardy's best adversaries. His brief appearance in Liberty casts him as a shopkeeper, whose shop front is besieged by Stan and Ollie. The nipping crab in Stan's pants makes him jump so hard that he demolishes Finlayson's display of records, knocking them over and smashing them to pieces on the pavement. Finlayson's reactions and over-the-top squints are typically hilarious. And indeed, nobody does it better. Laurel and Hardy's films are renowned for their innocence, but the subtle yet cheeky adult themes underlying these sequences are wonderfully handled. The comedy here is based on everybody who catches the boys in compromising positions, assuming they're gay and trying to engage in sexual acts. However, as film historian Simon Louvish notes, quote, The cleverness of Liberty is that Stan and Ollie's perfect innocence offers a childlike simplicity in their continual embarrassment at being caught, literally with their trousers down. In addition, much of the humour in this picture, as in most Laurel and Hardy movies, is in reactions. 
Here we can savour Stan and Ollie's embarrassed expressions at being discovered, combined with the supporting cast's shock, bemusement and disgust. Especially good is how the burly builders look over our boys with much suspicion as they exit the construction site elevator. From here, Liberty seamlessly develops from farce into thrill comedy, as Stan and Ollie find themselves tottering along the girders of an unfinished skyscraper hundreds of feet in the air, with the crab, as mentioned earlier, still nipping. Thrill comedy, like horror comedy, was an established and popular movie genre. The trope of someone clambering up on a high building dates back to the early days of cinema. Eventually, most of the silent movie clowns attempted it themselves, including Chaplin, Keaton and Harry Langdon. However, it's Harold Lloyd that is indelibly connected to this type of picture. Out of the 200 or so movies that Lloyd made, only five of them were high and dizzy thrill comedies, and yet it is for these that he is most remembered. The image of Harold dangling from the hands of a giant clock from his Hal Roach-produced feature Safety Last from 1923 is now one of the most iconic movie images in the world. Lloyd was a master filmmaker and understood the singular effect that thrill comedies had on the movie-going public. Quote, The circumstances that brought about the danger increased the comic irony, which added to the nervous laughter. The recipe for thrill pictures is a laugh, a scream, and a laugh. Combine screams of apprehension with stomach laughs of comedy, and it's hard to fail. End quote. Indeed, such was the shock element of these types of pictures to contemporary audiences that they were reported as a risk to audiences' health, as the following caption accompanying a newspaper photo illustrates. Quote, Crowds at the Kinema Theatre yesterday watching the ambulance take away one of the patrons who was overcome with the thrills of the Harold Lloyd comedy Safety Last. Ambulance calls were sent in several times yesterday, the first day of the run of the picture, to care for spectators who suffered from nervous shock on seeing the hairbreadth escapes of the famous film comedian. End quote. And that was in the Salt Lake Tribune, April 8th, 1923. The practical experience and knowledge the Roach Studios team gained through making the Lloyd Thrill comedies must have been incredibly valuable. In the film Look Out Below, 1919, there are several gags where Harold, B.B. Daniels and Snub Pollard are tottering around on girders in scenes very similar to those in Liberty. Further, the 1927 Hour Gang short, The Old Wallop, also used sky-high girders as the location for some of its comedic scenes, with the gang attempting to rescue Farina, who had accidentally been carried up on top of the construction site. So by the time the Laurel and Hardy unit decided to go high and dizzy, it would not have been a big challenge for the in-house team. The location selected for Liberty's lofty finale was the same building used for the Hour Gang short a year earlier, the Western Costume Building at 939 South Broadway, Los Angeles. To achieve the illusion of being high up on girders, the Roach construction crew had to build a 24 foot by 24 foot set, essentially a giant climbing frame, atop the building. In an interview with historian Randy Scretvet, crew member Thomas Benton Roberts revealed, quote, We had three stories of supposedly steel structure up on top of the Western Costume Building. Actually, it was all made out of wood. The roof of the building was 150 feet, and we were working three stories above that. Each time we changed the setup for a shot, we'd have to move the camera platform around and try to miss the flagpole on the corner of the building. End quote. This thrill sequence is fabulously constructed, littered with excellent gags, and bravely executed by actors and crew alike. In 1954, during the filming of This Is Your Life, a programme dedicated to Stan and Babe's career, director Leo McCary recounted a story from the production of Liberty. Yes, I remember once when Oliver got in trouble without any help from Stan. Yeah, well, how's that? Well, uh, we were shooting a, a picture up on... Um, on a, uh, the, the two of them were, were building a uh, skyscraper, mm -hmm. and uh, and they were up about uh, 40 feet from the ground, and uh, Stan was looked down, standing up on his girder, and he got quite panicky, and uh, Babe tried to quiet him, and yeah. he said, look, you don't have to worry, there's a safety platform about 15 feet under the scaffolding. <laughs> and Stan looked down, and he said, well, even the, the safety platform doesn't look safe to me. <laughs> and Babe tried to quiet him, he says, look, to show you that it's perfectly all right. <laughs> He said, I'll, I'll show you. And he jumped off. Well, it wasn't safe. <laughs> and uh, the platform slowed him down a little, but he fell 20 and then 20 more feet. 
to the ground. Adding validity to the story, Thomas Benton Roberts recounted the same story during the aforementioned interview with Randy Screvet, adding, quote, The studio had sent some sugar pine down to make a safety platform for them. I had complained about that, but I wasn't the head standby on the company, so I could only carry out orders. When Babe jumped down, the sugar pine, of course, broke. But I had a safety net below that, and that saved him. Babe only fell about 20 feet instead of 200. He only suffered minor bruises and quickly got back to work. Further evidence is provided by the following contemporary article reported in Variety. Quote, Hi, dizzy and sick. When Stan Laurel stands on a girder with nothing much under him and is told to look frightened, he simply looks natural. So much does he feel his part that nausea succeeds dizziness. Laurel, working high up above Los Angeles streets with Babe Hardy, was told he was in no danger because of a safety platform of one and a half inch pine below him. Laurel's scepticism was confirmed when his 280 pound teammate slipped from a beam and fell to the safety platform, which failed to do all of its appointed duty. Hardy kept on going south, right to his elbows, which fortunately held. Hardy was considerably bruised, but Laurel was really ill. End quote. And that was from Variety, October 17th, 1929. Several extant production stills show scenes that were likely filmed but not included in the final release. These show Stan and Ollie clambering around the girders with supporting actor Tom Kennedy. Although audiences never saw Kennedy's efforts on the girders, he does make an appearance at the start of the picture as the shotgun-wielding cop chasing the boys through the trees. For reasons unknown, on November 13th, director James Horn was sent to the top of the Western Costume Building along with Stan, Babe and all the crew to shoot six days' worth of retakes, plus a final day of retakes at the county hospital. Filming was eventually completed on November 19th. Liberty was the third consecutive Laurel and Hardy film to be released with a synchronised music and effects track. The Victor Talking Machine Company again recorded the orchestral score in New York with direction by Joseph Pasternak. As in the boys' previous two films, the musical score helps the film along tremendously. The titles of the popular tunes used, for instance, Wobbly Walk, I'm Flying High, and I'm Sitting on Top of the World, add another layer of comedy value for any musically informed viewer. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, following its release, Liberty was afforded mostly excellent reviews. Quote, This comedy is a classic! from the Silver Family Theatre, Grenville, Michigan. Boy, oh boy, what a comedy! You remember how safety last left them gasping? This will do the same. Be sure and feature it. It's chock full of laughs. From the Central Theatre, Selkirk, Manitoba. Usual Laurel Hardy laugh riot. These boys don't need to do anything but appear on our screens to set off the uproar. By far the best all-round comedy subject we are using from the Screenland Theatre, Nevada, Ohio. They get better. This one is a scream, and I know it pleased, for I had an uproar all through this comedy. That's the Adair Theatre, Adair, Idaho. When these two fail to give them a laugh, they must be sick. They are great. I have used seven of them so far this season, and have yet to get hold of a bad one. Prince, excellent. That was from the Star Theatre, Wendell, North Carolina. And for the sake of balance, proving that you can't win them all, our final review reads, Liberty, not so hot. Fawn on top of a framework, and they lost their pants. Can't compare with two tars. Kind of funny in the last reel. Uh, And that was the Princess Theatre in Lincoln, Kansas. Liberty is an excellent comedy, and many notable commentators, including William K. Everson, Charles Barr, and Randy Scretvet, have sung its praises over the years. However, despite the film's apparent success, and unlike Harold Lloyd, Stan and Babe never ventured into the thrill comedy genre again. It's fair to say that Hal Roach Studios had mastered the art of silent comedy, and Liberty is a testament to that. In normal circumstances, the filmmakers would understandably be at ease and feel rather pleased with themselves. However, as 1928 drew to a close, something somewhat problematic was hanging over the lot of fun. A cloud of uncertainty was weighing heavy and was occupying the mind of the studio's general manager. 
A few days after the completion of filming Liberty, the Hal Roach Studios general manager Warren Doan wrote to Roach detailing his suggestions on how best to move forward and embrace the ever-present and ominous problem of the talkies. In his memo, dated October 27th, 1928, Doan said, quote, There are some basic thoughts I wish to present with regard to the making of dialogue pictures. It would be my idea that we should continue the making of silent pictures exactly as we have in the past, up to the time when the picture has been previewed and finally accepted as ready for shipment. At that time, I believe it will be possible in a very short space of time, not more than an hour or two, to photograph synchronised dialogue action, which, when cut into one of the negatives, will give us a dialogued motion picture. This dialogued motion picture can then be synchronised by the Victor company, as they are now doing. I would like to strongly recommend that we immediately take steps to urge the Victor company to furnish only a movie tone outfit, so that the cost of the studio installation may be kept at a minimum. Thus we could avoid loading the picture costs unnecessarily and derive a substantial benefit, as well by keeping their percentage at a more modest figure. It should be borne in mind that we have definite plans for a sharp reduction in picture costs, and if their input is not carefully watched, the percentage will be very detrimental. End quote. Understandably, Warren Doan was focused on the financial bottom line and the considerable impact that fully equipping the studios for sound recording would have on it. Roach would no doubt have been pleased that his general manager was so concerned. However, Doan's risk-averse stance and narrow focus were not shared by his boss. Roach's forward-thinking nature and willingness to take risks led him to reject Doan's recommendations. Although he may not have had a clear vision of how everything would pan out, the producer instinctively knew that the talkies were here to stay. If he wanted to remain on top of his game, he would have to bite the bullet and convert the whole studio for sound recording. So that's precisely what he did. You don't believe me. Yes, I don't believe... What do you mean, you don't believe me? Our first guest on the blogcast today is John Bengston. Uh, John is a business lawyer, film historian and lecturer whose books Silent Echoes, Silent Traces and Silent Visions explore the early Hollywood history hidden in the background of the films of Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin and Harold Lloyd. John's work has been hailed by the New York Times as a Proustian collage of time and memory, uh, biography and history, urban growth and artistic expression. What a fabulous sentence that is. <laughs> uh, John has lectured at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the Turner Classic Movie Channel Film Festival, Cineteca di Bologna, both Film Forum and the Museum of, Mo uh, the, Museum of the Moving Image in New York, uh, USC, the American Cinematheque and Cinecon Classic Film Festival. Um, and if that's not enough, he's also provided commentaries and bonus programmes for 16 Keaton, Chaplin and Lloyd DVD and Blu-ray releases. Um, I think the New York Times summed it up best where they said, John Bengston, the great detective of silent film locations. John, welcome to the Laurel and Hardy blogcast. Wow, well, thank you, Patrick. It's an honour to be here and... Uh... Anyway, I paid, you should know, I paid him to read that. So <laughs> I don't believe that for a minute, sir. I don't believe it for a minute. Uh, John, um, I absolutely love um, reading your blogs um, on the website. I, I just, you could just get lost. Well, you do get lost. I frequently get lost down the rubber holes of your website. Um, but I, I, I've always had a fascination in, uh, of history and, and particularly of local history. Obviously, LA is not local to me, but... By the same token, you know, I, I used to walk around uh, the streets where I grew up with photographs, looking at where my ancestors used to live, where they grew up, and, and spotting the buildings and looking above the shop facades and all of that and finding the old uh, buildings. So I really, really have uh, a deep interest in, in what you do. So I'm, I'm fascinated in, uh, in, in, in the, what we're going to discuss today. Um, so what, what I'd like to do before we... Um, today's talk is, uh, or today's podcast even, is, is, is focused towards Laurel and Hardy's film Liberty. Uh, now you have a, uh, a blog, Laurel and Hardy's Liberty Rooftop, um, which is what's directed me uh, t towards you. Um, but before we start talking about that, John, what I'd like to do and what I always try to do with new guests is to actually find out a little bit about yourself, uh, about your background and your involvement in the sort of the world of silent comedy um, and how you were drawn into it, if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, 
I became aware of silent comedies as a kid. They would show movies on on PBS, the public broadcasting station. And um, and also, when I was a little older, they would play The Little Rascals and The Three Stooges. Um, but there was, there was just something intriguing about, you know, vintage short comedy films. They don't make them. Yeah. They didn't make them when I was a kid, and they don't make them now. So yeah. there's something very entertaining and appealing about them. Um, but as I grew older, I also began to realize that they captured this real world. There was this vivid real world where these comedians and kids ran around and it existed somewhere. And uh, somehow I find that very compelling because if you dig, if you dig into the film, if you do enough research, you can kind of use these movies as a time machine. You can travel into the past and, uh, you know, it, it, Laurel and Hardy didn't really film much in Palms. Palms was a little neighborhood north of Culver City. But right. all of the silent Our Gang comedies were filmed in Palms. And you'd see the same street corner, the same shop in movie right. after movie after movie. Yeah. And sort of like with, with Tiles of a Mosaic, the more locations you discover, uh, the more angles that you discover, you start to build this mental image of what it was like a hundred years ago. Yeah. And I just, I just find that fascinating. Um, there are many, yeah. many neighborhoods in downtown Los Angeles or Culver City or in Hollywood where I have a very clear idea what it would be like to walk around there a hundred years ago. Brilliant. Uh, and another, it's, it's kind of interesting too. One of my favorite tools of all is a vintage aerial photograph, an oblique aerial photograph. So it's not state. It's not pointed straight down like a satellite image, but it's taken from an airplane at an angle, and it right. usually encompasses several blocks. But in these vintage aerial photographs, I can look at one and I go, "Oh, well, that's where Lowell and Hardy filmed this scene at this corner, and Buster filmed this scene at that corner." Wow. And there's some some of these vintage photos where I can spot like 20 different films all on this one photo, and I don't know. Like I said, it, it just gives a context. To me, it makes it all real, and uh, I just, I don't know. I, for some reason, I just find that endlessly fascinating. Yeah. Oh, without a doubt. It, it, it's. Uh, I mean, I've never I've never been to um, to Los Angeles and to Culver City. It's something that is you know it really is on the bucket list. I've got it. I've got to make the the trip one of these days. Um, but just because I, because I've never been there, I think I look at the films and I think about the locations, and it's almost like cartoon characters to me because it, you just kind of think that can't be real you know those places can't exist uh, but, I mean I know damn well they do uh, but it just yeah it just seems unreal to me um, so can you can you recall how you sort of came across Laurel and Hardy what your earliest memories of them are John well it must have been on television um, and I was thinking about this question I uh, I only bought about 10 record albums as a teenager uh, and some of them were like Scott Joplin. So it kind of, yeah. uh, and I wouldn't say I, I was a cinephile, but for some reason I also bought about 10, you know, eight millimeter Blackhawk films. So right. when I was a teenager, I, I bought a copy of Cops by Buster Keaton and I bought a copy of Big Business by Lola cool. and Hardy. Yeah. And I had, I had an eight yeah. millimeter print of these films. And, uh, Anyway, I, I don't consider myself an absolute diehard film fan, uh, the way some, some people have huge collections. But yeah. I do think it's uh, unusual that whereas most people had, you know, hundreds of record albums, uh, I spent my money instead and, and bought 10. I, I, I didn't buy 100, but I bought 10 classic short comedy films. But yeah, yeah. Big Business was one of them. And... Again, it's just, you know, they're, they're wonderful films, wonderful characters. But again, it was another time and era. And yes. uh, it, just, it just draws you in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you just mentioned a few minutes ago about the Hour Gang um, locations in Palms. So I'm guessing this is before um, the studios had the back lot, because obviously we, we're so right. familiar with the back lot scenes. Yeah, these are, the, so this when- these are the silent films and then the early, the early 1931, 32 talkie films. Um, and it's interesting, Harold Lloyd, Harold Lloyd, when he worked for Roach, he filmed in Palms. And actually, uh, Buster Keaton, working with Roscoe Arbuckle, they made some movies on Main Street in Culver City and in Palms. 
And they filmed there uh, years before Laurel and Hardy made a movie on Main Street in Culver City. It was almost 10 years earlier. Roscoe Arbuckle and Buster Keaton were walking up the same block. Um, and and the reason why at the time for the for the the couple of films that Roscoe and Buster made, where they did film in Culver City and in Palms, they were using. I'm trouble remembering the names of the studios. It's the uh, it was the studio that was next to the Hal Roach studio. The Hal Roach studio hadn't even been built yet, but they were work they were working out of that studio, and so they Culver and Palms was obviously the closest place to go. But it's just. It's interesting to me that, like I said, Buster Keaton and Harold Lloyd filmed at places, you know, years before Laurel and Hardy filmed there. Um, That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it, it's hard to sort of put that into, into that kind of context when we're looking at it from so far away. But, but, it, yeah, but it makes the, the, sense. You know, Lloyd worked for Roach. And so naturally, yeah. uh, Roach had a great familiarity with Culver City and Palms when he when he started doing Laurel and Hardy. So... He, they already had a long list of places to film. They had that in their back pocket when they started making Laurel and Hardy films. Um, yes, of course. So this is from so so this is the Roach Studios at the top, or the Rolling Studios, I guess it would be back then. Uh, this is the old mansion. The um, I'm trying to think of the name of the yeah, it's it's the Bradbury Mansion on the top Bradbury of Court mansion. Hill. Yeah, that's right, and, and that's where Lloyd did Lloyd film Spooks. In the mansion. Haunted Spooks, right, yes. He filmed it and yes. he filmed his first thrill comedies. Uh, there was a, that Roland studio was on a hilltop and there was a tunnel, a twin bore tunnel running underneath that hill. And there was a railing and you, you could stand at the railing and look south uh, down Hill Street and see these buildings in the background. And they figured out if you built a set above this railing and filmed down the street, you're only, you know, four feet above the ground, but because you're above this tunnel, the background down the street looks like you're, you know, 10 stories up in the air. And um, there must have been 20 different movies using that effect filmed at the Hill Street, above the Hill Street Tunnel. Uh, and Charlie Chaplin made a movie at, at the same Bradbury Mansion uh, around the same time that Harold was there. So it's just... Los Angeles was was so undeveloped at the time. There was like downtown, there was the center of Hollywood, but in between it was just vast open space. And so it's not surprising that they would overlap with their locations because they actually had fewer fewer choices then at the time. Yes, of course, of course. Uh, which makes me think of the uh, the alleyway, of course, the Chaplin Keaton Lloyd. Uh, have I got down the right order? Chaplin Keaton Lloyd Alley is that is the official title now? The Chaplin Keaton Lloyd Alley. Um, it is alphabetical, chronological, and right. I would say I don't know if that would be my favorite order, but I also think in terms of their <laughs> present day historic significance, I think that's also the order people yeah. would rank them. But yeah, yeah it worked out. Chronological and alphabetical. Yeah. That. <laughs> That's right. And was am I right in thinking? Because I, 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 I suppose for listeners who who are not familiar with with the alley with the alleyway itself, it's where Harold Lloyd shot Safety Last, Chaplin shot The Kid, yes, and Keaton was. Uh, and it's where Buster it Keaton Cops? filmed uh, the stunt from Cops. He runs out Cops, the alley yeah. and grabs a passing car one handed. Yes, and very famous. Is, to see. Buster made two other movies at the alley, and Harold made another movie at the alley. But Oliver Hardy, working with Billy West, he filmed a scene at the alley. So the same alley where Buster runs out during Cops, Oliver Hardy runs out chasing after Billy West. And it, the movie was called uh, Rivals. Um, right, right. So could we could we squeeze on Hardy at the end of the alleyway then? Can we have that? <laughs> well, that was that's the goal. Is that uh, if <laughs> if we if we ever do a mural, we could have a real collage uh, because I don't know there have been at least I think close to thirty silent movies that were made there, and you know Ben wow. Turpin and you know Oliver oh, Hardy, wow. Douglas Fairbanks. Um, wow. Yeah, the list goes on. If those walls could talk, that's fun. So, so is a mural something that's in the in the offing? Then is it? That's what. So yeah, it's you're it's a, it's sort of a long term goal. Um, you know, I don't I don't live in Hollywood. I li I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, and so um, I I gently nudge people, uh, but the but the the local people are the ones who really do all the hard work and 
and get things done. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just there to support them and occasionally yeah. give them a little nudge in the right direction. Uh, well, congratulations on, on getting the plaque uh, for the Alu, because that obviously that took a long time and uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's rightly, rightly going to be remembered now. So fantastic work. Um, so can you, um, I mean, I think you've probably been asked this question many times and, and I, I don't think from the last, the last time I heard you interviewed, you didn't know the answer then. Filming on the streets of, of, of Los Angeles and, and Culver City and wherever a hundred years ago, do are we any closer to knowing if that was something that they just did ad hoc or did they have to get permits for that or is it something that you know they just rolled up and, and grabbed a, a shot here and there? That's a fascinating question and I, I still can't answer it. And I guess, like I said before, my, my answer is I've, I've been, silent film locations have been on my radar for 25 years. And I've never, I've never stumbled across an article that explains, oh, this is how you go out and get a permit from the police department to film on a street. So I just have to think it was more ad hoc. There's some, there's some Harold Lloyd films. You can look down the street and you can actually see the traffic is stopped and there's some policemen standing there. So I, I think the best explanation is they probably, they probably have friends at the local, the local police station and they say, Hey, we'll, we'll make a donation to the, you know, the policeman's ball or something, but we're going to film next week. Can you help us out? Yeah. 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 And I suppose it's in their best interest as well to go along with it. Otherwise there's going to be chaos on the streets, isn't there? Uh, it reminds me of some of the um, photos, the behind the scenes photos uh, of Laurel and Hardy and uh, Men of War in the park there. And you can see all, all this ton of crowd yes. all behind the cameras watching and stuff. It's fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Um, okay, um, so just thinking about, I mean, is, are, are there any kind of um, Laurel and Hardy locations that you've come across that, um, you know, are, because obviously the Laurel and Hardy locations are quite well documented now. Right. Um, you know, the, the brilliant Bob Satterfield has been, at, you know, sort of recording tons of them. And uh, is there anything that you found that you've come across that you thought that's unusual or different or something that's not been perhaps found before? Well, I, I don't think I've found any Laurel and Hardy, um, but uh, it's Stan Laurel did a movie called The Egg or The Pest. Mm. Um, I, that's one of the things I didn't take notes on. But uh, he stands before a very, very length, tall stairway. Um, and that's nearby where they, the stairway for the music box. But it's a different stairway. Oh, wow. And um, so that, that was fun to discover and it's still there um and then like i said you know re recognizing that uh, oliver hardy actually did film at the chaplain keaton lloyd alley um yeah it's kind of yeah. crazy but you you recognize brick patterns and uh, there's the broken drain spout <laughs> but you look at yeah. things like that and anyway yeah yeah but no this is and as you say i mean i guess you you probably watch films a lot differently to the way that i and most people watch watch films um but yeah as you're right as you sort of when you spot something once and you see it again it starts to register every single time you see it again and again i know the there's a particular um wall of one of the uh studio walls in the halbrook studios these big sort of they look like breeze blocks right you? and right. you keep seeing it always oh, there again yeah 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 it's there again. absolutely yeah those are very yeah. Uh, distinguishable yeah but it's but it's really nice because it gives it, it I don't know it makes you feel more connected to the film in a way because you you you're piecing things together and clicking you know, clicking it together, it's fascinating. Um, okay, in terms of liberty, um, what can you tell us about the the filming of liberty, where they film liberty, and um, you know any any sort of um, comparisons with say Harold Lloyd, I guess you know because obviously he did his um, Hal Roach comedies. Um, from is it 1919 i think high and dizzy comedies so liberty has uh you know the opening scenes they're running along some country road and that is likely somewhere near culver city there's just not enough of a of a background or clues to really determine it there are also a couple of shots of a motorcycle chasing them and you can you can tell it's a new subdivision they've they've paved the road and and put in the cement sidewalks but there aren't any houses yet. And I'm, I'm certain that's probably very close to the, the Hal Roach studio. And then there are a couple of scenes in Culver City itself. When they get out of the taxi, there's a, I mean, out of the, uh, the car, 
you can see the Culver City Chamber of Commerce building behind them. And that was on Culver, Culver Boulevard. And there's a good shot of that building in the Little Rascals movie, um, The Kid from Borneo. But anyway, that's, that's the Chamber of Commerce building. So that when they get out of the car, they're actually in front of where the, the alley where they filmed the pant changing scenes. And that alley was right there in Culver Boulevard. It was between the, the Lock, Lockland building and the Adams Hotel. The Adams Hotel was a two-story hotel. And right. if you think about it, what do you need for a comedy, especially a silent comedy? Well, one thing that's very handy is a corner. And then another thing that's very handy is an alley. With a corner, if you place the camera looking at both sides of the corner, you know, the villain can be on one side of the corner and the hero can be on the other side of the <laughs> corner. And neither one yeah. of them knows that they're about to run into each other. But because of where the camera's placed, the audience can anticipate that they're going to run smack into each other. Um, yeah. So corners are a very handy thing to have. But likewise, alleys. You, need, you can't beat a good alley for making a silent comedy. And... <laughs> One reason why they use the, the Chaplin Keaton Lloyd Alley so often in Hollywood is that, especially in the early years, there just really weren't many other alleys in Hollywood. But oh, right. so it was almost literally uh, by by necessity. But but right. for Liberty, this little alley behind the Adams Hotel, it's perfect. You know, it's a block from the Roach Studio. Um, it's well lit. It runs north south. So it has good light. And you see it pop up again and again. You know, they, they run by it. Uh, I think it's during Do Detectives Think, they run by it. Uh, the alley shows up in a number of silent R gang uh, comedies. And then in, a, in, in We Fall Down, they, they jump in and out of the Adams Hotel. And so you can see, you can see the entranceway to the alley behind them. Um, so... It was a perfect alley, and like I said, it was a block away. So why why would you why go anywhere else? Um, and what's really fun is that the uh, I don't know if you had a chance to talk to Jim Delap, but he's he's a an expert, and he's he studied uh, the the American TV shows Starsky and Hutch and Charlie's Angels, and they filmed when they needed seedy, run down locations. They went back to Culver City. And so it's really funny to see that uh, these 70s, you know, detective shows were filmed at the same alley that Laurel and Hardy used in Liberty. Um, That's incredible. Is that alley still there, John? No, it, no. The uh, Culver City, you know, for better or worse, it's been it's been upgraded a lot. Uh, yeah. a, one street has been turned into a, sort of a pedestrian mall. Uh, they built a giant parking structure. Um, so I think if you live there today, it might actually be a more comfortable place to visit and enjoy. Uh, but in the process, uh, yeah, some of these, some of these locations uh, got bulldozed. Yeah. That's progress. That's, yeah. <laughs> uh, and and uh, it, the, the actual sort of high and dizzy scenes, obviously that's the Western costume building. Am I right in that one? Right. And then, of course, the climax of the film is the uh, – where they're climbing around on the, the skyscraper under construction. And I'm, I'm aware, well, Harold Lloyd, his first, he, he made a movie called Look Out Below. And that was at the Bradbury Mansion looking over the, the tunnel. And, and they built a skyscraper set. And so he was, and I forget if that was 1917, um, so anyway, the, 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 the idea of someone being trapped on a high rise under construction it had been filmed many times. And and the R gang, they they did a movie called The Old Wallop, which is has which was also filmed at Western Costume. They're also climbing around a skyscraper under construction. And that was filmed a year before. But instead of Laurel and Hardy, it's a, a group of little kids. Um so it definitely is a a, a useful format. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it was like as handy as a pie fight or something. But uh, being stuck on top of a skyscraper was a was a very rich uh, comedy uh, vehicle to mine. Yeah, yeah. Can you can you sort of explain a little bit how 
because there, there, there are no stills of how they filmed the scenes there. I've seen one or two from a couple of Lloyd films. Uh, I think Hal Roach is standing on one of them, so there were, it was probably one of the you know, the very early ones. It wouldn't be safe to last. Um, but you know, can you just explain a little bit how they they actually achieved that that shot on the, on that building? Yeah. Well, for any stunt comedy, for any scene where you're supposedly high up on a building in great danger. The trick is that you're on a safe location on a rooftop or above a tunnel, but the camera, the camera has to be above you. The camera has to be above you and point down. Of course. And so by pointing down, it captures the distant street below, but you also crop the shot. You cut off the top of the building that you're standing on, or you cut off the railing, uh, you know, over the street tunnel overlook that you're at. Uh, but basically, that's that's the effect. As long as the camera's higher up, it gets the street far below, but cuts off the safe place where you're filming, you get the effect. It doesn't cost anything. And I'm, I'm constantly amazed that they don't use this effect today. It does. There's no CGI. Uh, the wind blowing across the actor's face is real. You don't need to cheat or there's no green screen or anything. And I think one reason why Liberty and these other films, why they really resonate with an audience is that, you know, you can, you can instinctively feel they are, they are literally 10 stories up in the air. They're only, you know, five feet above the roof, but they are 10 stories up in the air. And you just, you can't fake that. You just, you just somehow the audience intuitively gets that. And it it just adds to the, uh, the experience and the, uh, you know the shock and the the anxiety yeah. or whatever. That's right. Yeah, I was thinking that I was watching Liberty the other day. Um, it's doing doing the prep, and like you say, you, 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 there's a close up of uh, of Ollie's face, Ollie's face, and you can tell that he's in that airspace. He's not. Yeah, he's, he's not. You know, he's not on the ground, and it's a clever bit of trick photography. Um, it makes a massive. I don't know whether it's the light which is different or the the kind of breeze that blows yeah. across, but that you could really tell. You can really tell it up there. Yeah, and, fascinating. And one interesting thing is that um, they used a different approach for Liberty. Harold Lloyd, he, he was famous, you know, for Safety Last, and then he made a talking movie called Feet First. And in both of those films, he climbed up the side of a skyscraper. And to create the effect that you're going higher and higher up in the air, you had to build your sets atop increasingly taller buildings. Um, but with the skyscraper for Liberty, they're not, they're not going up and down the side of a building. They're at the top of the building. But, but for Harold, for safety last, he had, he had to film atop three increasingly taller buildings. And he also filmed his movies looking north, looking north up Broadway. But what they did for Liberty is that they filmed looking south down Broadway and from the Western Costume Building. But what's interesting is in the in the background, you can see a triangular building that's two stories tall. And that was the building that Harold used for the beginning of his climb in Safety Last and the beginning of his climb in Feet First. He built a set on that rooftop. And when he's hanging off that set, it looks like he's three stories up in the air. But it is it is a perfect view where one movie gives you a documentary view of where Harold Lloyd made his movies. And the the other interesting thing is that for Feet First, so so for Safety Last and Feet First, they they started out a two story building and then they jumped to a seven story building. Well, for Feet First, the seven story building that Harold used was across the street from the Western Costume Building. So Laurel and Hardy made Liberty directly across the street from where Harold Lloyd made Feet First. They were on the opposite sides of the street. And I think the address numbers are, you know, maybe it's 901 and 900, but I mean, they're, they're literally directly across the street from each other. But like I said, Harold's camera is pointing north and Lauren Hardy's camera is pointing south. And you, you get a different effect with each way the, the camera is pointing, but it's just for me, it's, it's, it's wonderful because you get a, you get a vintage aerial view of what Southern Broadway looked like at the time. Yeah, 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 it's fascinating. Uh, and um, 
as you said, our gang's old wallet was was filmed on the same on the same building, and also Richard Dix yes. in Day of Reckoning on the same on the same building. And Spanky played Richard Richard Dix's son in that movie, Day of Reckoning. <laughs> And I'm just looking at the, um, the the images that you got on on your um, on your blog, John, as well. So the, the images on Richard Dix. So w- would you say that's like a f- sort of a fake um, slanted rooftop they've got on there? Yes. Yeah. So that's part of their set that they've built up high. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. I will say i i had the I had the rare honor. I've actually been on the roof where Harold Lloyd filmed the clock scene in Safety Last. I've actually been there several times, and. Oh, wow. There was like a two foot little railing, um, I don't balustrade or something. There's a little, just to collect the rainwater, there's a little two foot lip all around the perimeter of the building. But if you're not paying attention, you can trip <laughs> and fall over. And uh, just to know, so what, what Laurel and Hardy did making Liberty, they had to go up. They had to go to the top of a 10 story building. They were aware that they had to pay attention because if they just kind of casually wandered off, they could fall, they could fall off. And I think that's a real testament to the, you know, the skill and the, uh, you know, the, the filmmakers are really dedicated to their craft. Um, but they did the hard work. They were up there on the top of the building and they had to be careful. Um, I'm sure, you know, obviously they, they took precautions, but if you've ever stood close to the edge of a, 10 story building you don't want to be looking at your phone and just wandering around you know? <laughs> no, exactly exactly but it, may, it makes me laugh because I, I know i think i've read uh, somewhere that um when harold lloyd was making his films they just had like a, a mattress at, on the on the floor to catch it you know to soften the the if he fell they did i mean that's just oh. I, I i mean harold was very secretive about filming safety last so i've never seen any behind the scenes photos but for mm. feet first, he did take photos showing the set. You know, the set is like two stories tall. There, right. there were mattresses. Yes, <laughs> there were mattresses <laughs> on the platform. Um, but oh, I guess that was the best they had. Well, yeah, I guess so. I was talk- I was chatting with uh, with Randy Scrabbett the other day about Liberty. We, we we were sort of discussing how on earth did they get the materials onto the roof, you know, because they got these huge, they must have been huge big timber beams to look like girders, just ticking them up, you know, up the elevators or what, ah, oh, just, just, it doesn't bear thinking about. And and also, of course, with, with Liberty, uh, it appears by the records that they shot the film and then they had to go back for six days of retakes a month later, so they probably dismantled the set and then had to put it back up again. That's just crazy. I, I don't have it in front of me, but I, I found the building permit. Um Oh yeah, yeah, that's on your on your site. Yeah, they they got a permit to build a, a temporary motion picture set on on the roof of the Western Costume Building for Liberty. And Randy told me that uh, I forget his name, but the the accountant, I guess, was the accountant or one of the uh, Roach Studio managers. Uh, Louis yeah, French. French. Yeah, he Louis signed, French. He signed yeah. the app the application to build the skyscraper <laughs> set. Uh, that's brilliant. I mean, that's a nice bit of documentary evidence, yeah. isn't it? As you say, to, you, when, when it's so hard to come across documents, sort of permits to film in the streets, at least at least we have something like that to look at. And uh, I mean, that, that actually tells us it was 24 foot by 24 foot set on, you know, on the uh, on the roof there. So brilliant work. Absolutely superb. Is the is the Western Costume Building still there, John? Yes, it still is. It's still there. Have you, you've never been on the roof of that one? No, no, I haven't. It's on your bucket list. Um, well, maybe on the second page. <laughs> oh, fantastic, and um, yeah, it, it is. It is. Because I think was Harold Lloyd scared of heights. Have I ever read that right somewhere? I'm sure he was scared. I know BB Daniels was certainly scared of heights. She was terrified, I believe. I, if I remember correctly, Mildred Mildred Davis, who who made Safety Last with Harold, and he later married. She was scared of heights. Oh, it's Mildred. Yes, it's probably Mildred Davis. And I, I of, seem yeah. to recall he had to like bribe her with jewelry. They needed, yeah. <laughs> no, seriously, they, they needed to film an extra scene or something. And uh, yeah, so fantastic. The powers of bribery. 
<laughs> and of course, there's that great story of Stan as well in Liberty. He was he was terrified looking down at the safety this in inverted commas safety platform. Yeah, um, that uh, Babe then plummeted through and <laughs> smashed straight through. <laughs> it's fantastic. Love it. That's great stuff. Um, brilliant. Um, okay, before I let you go, John, what I'd like to do, with, as I do with all um, with all guests, is ask you the atoll question. Yes. Um, so the atoll question: You are about to be stranded on a desert island or atoll, uh, and you're allowed to keep with you one of each of the following items. So you're allowed a Laurel and Hardy silent short, a talkie short, a feature film, a Laurel and Hardy related book. Uh, and I'm also going to let you keep with you any other cinema-related book of your choice, but you can't choose your own, unfortunately. Yep. As good as they are, uh, you have to choose somebody else's. Um, so, um, so to start with, so which Laurel and Hardy silent short can I give you for your atoll? It would be big. It would be big business. Oh, like I said, I, I owned it when I was a teenager, and uh, yeah. yeah, it's just I have so many wonderful memories tied to that film. Yeah, and that location is just ridiculous. It looks just like it did in the in the film. Oh, and I just remembered a tangent. Oh, can I interrupt? Go for it. We do love a tangent. All right. So the Jimmy Finland's Jimmy Finland's house. Uh, it's easy for you to say. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Jimmy's house in Big Business was on yeah. uh, Dunlear Drive. Right. And. I've I found some vintage aerial photographs, and you can see his house and the house next door, and it's pretty much surrounded by vacant lots. Oh, right. But okay. but ten years later, uh, the house that Buster Keaton, when when Buster was divorced from his wife Natalie and had to move out of the Italian villa, his big mansion, mm. and was when he was sort of suffering through his down years, he had a home at uh, 3151 Queensbury Drive in the Cheviot Hills. And that is one block from Jimmy's house in big business. Oh, wow, is it really? And it could. there's one or two shots in big business that's a point of view looking from the house at Jimmy yelling in the street. Yeah. And so behind him, this could literally be true, that behind him there is a tree that could have been in Buster's future backyard. Oh wow! So anyway, there, there's there's my tangent. <laughs> That's a great story. I love it. That's amazing. That's a really really. I've not heard that one before. That's a great one, John. Okay, so you have big business. An excellent excellent choice. So this one's always a little bit harder. The Laurel and Hardy talkie short. Well, I hope Men of War is a talkie, right? It is a talkie. Yeah, it was good. Okay. third talkie. Yeah, yeah. Only just, but it is. Yeah. <laughs> Men yeah, I, I love that film, and, and and one reason why is just Holland Beck Park uh, was such a wonderful place, and so many movies were filmed there. Mm. And Holland Beck Park is kind of bittersweet for me because they kept the park, but they built part of the freeway. Holland Beck Park was sort of a north-south park with a long, narrow lake running mm -hmm. through it. And it had the beautiful arched bridge that appears in Man of War, but Harold yeah. Lloyd jumped off that bridge in Haunted Spooks, and it's behind. Uh, I knew Groucho Marx filmed there for uh, Duck Soup or whatever when he's serenading uh, Thelma Todd. Oh, right. That's the way he is, is it? I didn't realize that. So the park has tremendous history, but they built a north south freeway. I'm terrible. I think it must be the Hollywood freeway, but they built a north south freeway. And so part of this freeway cuts over the park. There's part of the park now that is actually underneath. The oh, freeway. No, uh, that's criminal. <laughs> and another another function of the park is that there was an east west street. It was the Sixth Street Bridge, and it was at the south end of the park. But it was the only handy bridge in all of Los Angeles where you could jump off. It was only it wasn't a hundred feet up. It was like maybe fifty feet up. It was a significant jump to jump off that bridge into the lake, right. but it wasn't lethal. Yeah. And so, you know, Snub Pollard and, you know, Ben Turpin and uh, Larry Seaman. I mean, I don't know how many comedians have jumped off this bridge into Holland, into the lake at Holland Beck Park. <laughs> um, so, you know, the same lake where, you know, you know, Stan and Ollie are swim, flopping around. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, so that, that has a great connection for me. How far away from the Roach Studios is the park, just as a matter of interest? 
it would be it was actually a fair distance i don't know maybe really? 15 miles or you know it was not okay. it was not a quick easy yeah. place to go yeah um, yeah yeah but it had everything they needed for the for the filming yeah, yeah. that wasn't that was not the same park that um was it arbuckle got banned from um, there was a. It could oh, be Arbuckle filmed a couple of movies there. Yeah, yeah. There was one on. Was it he and Buster Keaton got banned from the park because they were roughing it up too much or something? I can't, I can't remember now. But uh, anyway, I digress. That's my tangent for the day. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go and do my homework. Um, okay, fantastic. So we've got big business and we have Men of War and for your Laurel and Hardy feature film. Well, I'll say Sons of the Desert. It's... Oh, yes. Classic. Yeah. Classic. Um, have you? Are there any locations from Sons of the Desert that you've come across? I'm trying to think of anything that's not, not nothing beyond what's already been. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. No, great choice, great choice. And your Laurel and Hardy related book. Well, I had to look up the exact title because I was just going to say Randy Scredvitt's book, but I'm, but it's it's the magic behind the movies. Of course it is. Of course uh, it is. Well, he, I mean, he has three books, of course. Now he has the two, the two script books as well, which is uh, right, which are, which are fantastic. Uh, but no, that is a, a wonderful book. Wonderful book. In fact, in Randy's book, talking of locations, um, in Liberty at the start when they when they're running away from the cop, um, Tom Kennedy, I think Randy says it's at the is it the Ar- Arnaz Ranch. That could very well be. Yeah. The, uh, the, stu- the Roach Studio had a ranch called the Arnez Ranch. There was a, a one-lane dirt road. It's just in Liberty, it looks a lot more, the, the, the trees and the vegetation and whatever around it seems a lot more dense. Right. So right. it doesn't, it could have been the Arnez Ranch, but it, it, it somehow feels to me like it must have been somewhere else. Yeah, sure. Uh, brilliant. Okay, and your final choice, uh, so make this a good one because you're on your atoll for a while, John. Yep. Uh, is any other cinema-related book of your choice? Well, it'll it'll have to be The Parade's Gone By. Oh, yes. And if I can yeah. name drop, um, yes. The Parade's Gone By by Kevin Brownlow. Kevin wrote the foreword for all three of my books, which was an yeah. absolute amazing honor. And uh, I, had, I had the a special honor... A couple of years ago, the, a year before COVID, I actually spent a day driving Kevin around Los Angeles, showing him different <laughs> uh, silent movie locations. And we went to the music box steps. Did you? So I, 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 I got to take Kevin Brown to the, the music box steps. He'd never been there before. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so for many, many reasons, it, it would be Kevin's book. Yes. No, it's an excellent choice. Excellent choice. Brilliant. John, it's been an absolute treat uh, to chat with you about the, uh, about the, the locations. And uh, um, where, can, uh, where can people find you online if they want to look up your blog? What's the, uh, what's the address? It's uh, just uh, silentlocations.com. Fantastic. And I just wanted to ask you as well, uh, there was, I listened to you on a podcast a little while ago and you talked about the potential of doing a, a book on Laurel and Hardy locations and our gang locations and possibly Charlie Chase, a bit of a, a mixture hell roach. Is that still in the offing or have you put that one to bed? It's still kind of on my to-do list. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll see. Um <laughs> <laughs> don't worry we won't hold you to it yeah, it's yeah. fine <laughs> maybe, maybe you have the answer what, one challenge is if if one corner shows up in 38 Hal Roach films uh, how do you present that without driving people <laughs> bonkers yes. you know what I mean You'd have to, yes I know exactly what you mean <laughs> you'd have to have some, good, some, some kind of key with yeah. lots of asterisks, asterisks and yeah. things like that yeah. wouldn't you yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> Yes, I know what you mean. When they use the same one over and over again, it gets fairly rep- <laughs> repetitive. Right. Okay. Answers on a postcard. Any listeners who have got a good idea, that would be that would be good. I'll let yeah, you yeah. know, John, if we get any results in. Yeah, fantastic. But that would be that would be a wonderful uh, addition to the to the set. Um, but uh, John, thank you so much for spending time with us today. It's been wonderful to catch up with you and to uh, to hear all about the locations, especially of Liberty as well. And uh, hopefully, would you uh, would you come on again another time if we have a particularly location based um, episode? Oh, absolutely. This was this was a great honor and, and so much fun. It was really, really nice meeting you, Patrick. Philip, and yourself, John. Yeah, you take care. Thanks ever so much. We'll all speak right. To you soon. Thanks again. Bye, everyone. He's a great guy, isn't he? He certainly is. You know, I like him. Oh.
Here to help us scale the dizzy heights of episode 26 and discuss Laurel and Hardy's two-reeler Liberty is someone with a voice that will be very familiar to you by now. So I'm thrilled to be able to welcome back to the broadcast the man behind, the magic behind the movies, it's Randy Skretvet. Hello, Randy. Hello there, Patrick. Thank you for having me on the, uh, the, the, the what do we say, the, 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 the podcast, I guess now. I was, the podcast, the blogcast, anything at all. I was going to say broadcast, but this isn't radio really, is it? It's almost radio. We're playing at radio. Yeah. We, we can pretend it's radio. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> um, it's great to have you back, Randy. Always, always a treat. Um, before we before we get into um, the discussion of Liberty, which I'm really looking forward to, I just want to say congratulations on your new Laurel and Hardy script book, Volume 2. Yes. Uh, now, we did touch on this very, very briefly uh, the last time we spoke. It had just, I think it, it had just come out. Um, but I realised afterwards that we didn't really give it uh, as much of a spotlight as I would have liked. Um, so would you like to just... Uh, explain to the listeners what they're missing if they haven't already grabbed themselves a copy well uh, as, as with the volume one which came out about three or four years ago uh, these are original Laurel and Hardy scripts and uh, you know back in 1980 we didn't even know that Laurel and Hardy had ever really used scripts for the short subjects we assumed they did for the features but you know we heard so much about their ad-libbing abilities and that everything was just shot off the cuff and that sort of thing but then at the Hollywood 80 convention, there was a, a dealer there who had some Laurel and Hardy scripts. And so uh, during the, the rest of 1980, I did a lot of research into that uh, through several different collections. And uh, a lot of the uh, descriptions of the sequences that uh, didn't make it to the final film are in Magic Behind the Movies. But I still had a few actual scripts. And so that was volume one. And then this past December, uh, I was alerted by our friend Richard Band to an auction uh, going on a little auction house in Ohio that had uh, 10 lots of eight Hal Roach Studio scripts each. And I was in the rare position of being able to afford such things. And so I thought for the sake of history, I'd better get them. I did. Yeah. And there were 20, I think 23 uh, scripts uh, or cutting continuities for films that I hadn't used in volume one. Uh, so what you have there is uh, primarily scripts for uh, things from Why Girls Love Sailors, uh, Two Tars, The Music Box, Them Thar Hills, uh, Helpmates, a lot of the really wonderful Laurel and Hardy films, a lot of the very best Laurel and Hardy films, Toad in a Hole is another one, Oliver the Eighth. So it goes from 1926 through 1934. Um, I have uh, annotated yeah. each one of them. So it, before each script, uh, I provide some historical background about the production of the film and also uh, delineate what is different from the script and the film. Because as Hal Roach said many times, I'm sure I have him on tape saying this, he used to say, 50% of what's in the script will not play. And that was just a given. And that's a very yeah. wise thing uh, and, and rather surprising. You would think that a, a, a cost-conscious movie producer would say, no, we wrote it this way. That's the way we're going to film it and let's get on with it. But no, Hal Roach understood that comedy is a very uh, elusive animal. And um, oftentimes what seems very funny on the script, uh, you get up in front of the cameras and you do it and it doesn't work. Or maybe there are budgetary concerns. Something is just too expensive to film and they go with something that's cheaper. That was frequently the case with the Hal Roach Studios. So there are always significant differences between the script and the film. And that's what makes them fascinating to read. And even when they're describing scenes that are pretty much filmed as written it's fascinating to read how they describe these sequences that we've known for decades and here this is how it's written at the time of yes. the creation uh that that to me is fascinating just to read even if even if i know the sequence so uh in each case i give i i describe the differences between the script and the film and uh, the scripts are a lot of fun to read and so uh, that's basically what the book is it's 23 in the case of um uh, hats off and the rogue song rather than using scripts i do have the script for the rogue song but laurel and hardy's characters are not mentioned at all in it so that that proves that they were brought in after the film was thought to be completed and then falberg thought that they needed to add some comedy relief to it um but i have the cutting continuity now the difference between a cutting continuity and a script is a script is written before the filming a cutting continuity is a description of every shot, the action that happens in every shot 
sometimes even including the amount of feet and frames, the length of each shot. And they did this for copyright purposes in lieu of sending a print to the Library of Congress. Uh, in the case of Hats Off, that's actually more valuable than a script because since we don't have the film, this is a printed record telling us exactly what happened in every shot. And so you could theoretically go back and do a remake <laughs> if you can find something that looks like uh, Sunset and Vendome did in 1927. Uh, you could you could do a remake. At least you would know what happens in every shot of the film. Same thing for the Rogue song. And also, I have both the script and the cutting continuity for the Battle of the Century. Now, the script is very, very different. Instead of Stan slipping on a banana peel, there was this whole long sequence where uh, there was this grand piano being hoisted up to the second story of an apartment building. And Ollie thought, aha, we'll have the piano drop on Stan, and that's how we'll get the insurance money. Well, obviously, that was going to be a very expensive, not to mention involved and dangerous sequence to film. And so a banana peel really was a simpler and funnier idea, really, and cheaper, certainly. So that's one interesting in difference in the script. But as far as the cutting continuity is concerned, that was valuable for that sequence where Eugene Pallet, as the insurance salesman, is selling the policy to Ollie and Stan. And it's actually a, a pretty lengthy sequence. We're missing maybe two and a half minutes of the film. So it's nice to, to at least be able to read that little section that we're missing. So, so, so that's in the book as well. So yes. anyway, yes. for those of you who are interested in the archeology span of comedy and presumably anybody listening to this would be, uh, I think it's a, a valuable addition to the Laurel and Hardy library. If I say so myself. Uh, well, I, I will back that up. I will second that. It is a fantastic book and, and really uh, does sit alongside your other volumes. Um, and even, you know, alongside the magic behind the movies, because as comprehensive as that is, um, as you say, your annotations bring yet more detail out um, and, more, and, and more fantastic stills as well, which is great. Um, and on the subject of Hats Off remakes, have you seen that recent um, animation that's been done on YouTube? Yeah, that's that's very good. And there's also there's also someone has done a, uh, a reconstruction of the Rogue song. Uh, because the the entire soundtrack exists because it was available on discs and they've taken all the stills and the there's probably about 15 minutes of footage uh, only three minutes of which is Laurel and Hardy but they've spotted that where it belongs and it's it's actually quite interesting so uh, so so that's that's around as well and in fact uh, uh, pertaining more specifically to the film that we are going to discuss. Uh, someone on YouTube, I hope it's still up there, uh, put together a uh, an extended version of We Fall Down, uh, incorporating the uh, oh, okay. pants changing sequence, which wound up in Liberty, and uh, 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 it doesn't quite exactly sync up at the end, but but it's yeah. you know it gives you an idea of what the film was uh, envisioned as originally. I'll have to look that up. We'll, I, haven't okay. seen, I haven't seen that one. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. I was thinking, funnily enough, as well, um, the the very opening scene of Liberty, obviously the, the boys are in their um, prison garb mm -hmm. and running, uh, running down the street chased by the prison guard. Um, you, you could easily connect that up with something like um, Second Hundred Years as well. You know, uh, they would have, in, in the olden days, for yeah. the foreign audiences, made yeah. a bigger film out of it. They could have quite uh, easily done that as well. So, Well, as you know, for the for the foreign releases, they oftentimes did combine two or three shorts to make a more or yeah. less feature film. And uh, that 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 might have been a it might have been a good idea to do for a uh, second hundred years first and then have a bridging yeah. title and then go into Liberty. That actually would work, That's wouldn't right. it? It would, it would. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you'd have to, you'd have to, we'd have to get around because obviously they they turn their um, outfits inside out, uh, so they're just all white. So you well, have to sort of cut it in before that point. Well, no, at, no, at, at the end of Second Hundred Years, they're in the tuxedos and they've been discovered, and so they oh, just yes. march off back into prison, and yes. all you have to do is yes. fade out from that and then fade up, and there they are. Uh, just, just away, el yeah. eliminate the little montage at the beginning with all the lap dissolves, and just, yes. uh, just uh, fade up where where they're running in their prison suits from Tom Kennedy. Exactly, that would exactly. work. Actually, and what a what a what a fantastic segue. So here we are. Then we're, <laughs> we, we could. We, we I'm sure. I'm liberty. sure many Sons of the Desert tents have done all prison night and have shown Second Hundred Years Liberty and Pardon Us uh, as yeah. as their film program. 
Yeah, probably so. Yeah, yeah. but did they, did they did they link them together in that way? <laughs> I'd love to know. <laughs> so yeah, Liberty. I love Liberty. Have to say, it is uh, it, to my mind, it is one of the boys' best <laughs> silent comedies, if not even best comedies. Full stop. I think it's a cracker. It's a really, yeah. really good, yeah. good comedy. Yeah. Um, and what I lo- what I find very interesting about it is the fact that it is quite unique in their canon with the high and dizzy stuff, but it's also <laughs> unique in the way that it came about. Yes. Well, <laughs> it's it's a it's a film that started with its middle and uh, needed a, a beginning and end to finish it off. Yeah. Uh, uh, that yeah. was one thing when I was going through the scripts back in 1980. Uh, I found the script for We Fall Down, and of course, it has the scene where Laurel and Hardy have fallen into the gutter and have gotten all wet and so they're they go to the apartment of the two good time girls while their clothes <laughs> are drying out and then uh the uh, one of the girls boyfriends the tough uh, wrestler with the broken nose i've forgotten his name now but Castanoros. Uh, yes uh, Castanoros. okay yeah. very good thank you uh <laughs> i'm almost 64 i don't remember all these things now it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing i wrote all this down when i was in my 20s because i don't remember it now uh, pardon me for using, I have to use my cheat sheets here because I, I I can't just draw it up from memory anymore. Anyway, he, he gives chase to the boys. They run hastily out the window. And uh, now in We Fall Down, as it is exists now, they have their proper trousers on. But as it would have been, uh, they would have, in, in their haste, would have gotten the wrong trousers on and then said, oh, we got to change. Let's go change our trousers. So I'm reading the script for We Fall Down and I'm seeing, you know, here they are. Uh, they, they they go it, it, try to, to change trousers uh, in, in a taxi cab, and then they mm-hmm. then there's a fish market, and I'm recognizing yeah. all of these sequences, and I'm going, wait a minute, this is in Liberty, and I went, oh aha aha, two films where they have to change t- clothes hastily, ah, so what happened was deductive reasoning, uh, you know, they wanted to keep things to a two reel length. And they had this great sequence, but but they just didn't have enough time for it. And, and the exhibitors did not like three reelers, nor did MGM. It kind of threw a monkey wrench into programming because shorts were always assumed to be two reelers. And uh, so uh, they just said, well, we got this great scene, too good to throw away. What are we going to do with it? And so they built their next film around that sequence. They had to come up with another reason for them to be in the wrong trousers and having to change. Well, what would be a reason for them? Who are they escaping from this time? You know, the not a not another jealous boyfriend, not the wives. I've got it. They'll be convicts and they're in their convict garb and they've got a couple of buddies who've got clothes for them to change into. There we go. And so that was a very ingenious framing device to get to that sequence. And uh, th- now the idea of them climbing up a, a skyscraper, I, I where that came from, heaven only knows, except for the fact that that is another silent comedy stock in trade that they hadn't done yet. Uh, And if if anybody wants to go through all of it, at the beginning of my chapter in Magic Behind the Movies, I describe this long, 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 long litany of other comedies where comedians are clambering on top of skyscrapers. And there's dozens and dozens of them so i won't go into all of that now you can read that in magic behind the movies but uh, uh let's just say i was surprised about that because i we sort of we, we think about harold lloyd yeah you know straight away because obviously that's the that's the obvious what he was sort of most known for yeah even though he even though he only did about five out of something like 200 films that he made which is incredible yeah. but um yeah the, the list is incredible and it, it includes chaplin and i think uh, keaton did one um, and all, yeah, there was just so many. Every uh, everybody did. Har- Harold Lloyd was neither the the most prolific in that regard, nor was he the first. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Chaplin did it in 1914 in a film called The New Janitor, and the, yeah. the 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 Harold Lloyd ones are shorts: Look Out Below, High and Dizzy, and Never Weaken, and then the feature Safety Last, and then many many years later, but using process shots this time, uh, The Sin of Harold Diddlebach or Mad Wednesday has a High and Dizzy sequence. But yes. uh, and feet first as well. I think feet first is. Oh yeah, um, right. Feet first also. Yes. Yeah. But uh, yeah. but uh, everybody uh, did that. In fact, 
the, the other Hal Roach movies that do this. Um, uh, Charlie Chase in uh, Publicity Pays, 1924. Clyde Cook in Should Sailors Marry, 1925. And the Our Gang Kids did one called Seeing Things in 1924. And in 1927, they were at the same location where Laurel and Hardy are in Liberty in a short called The Old Wallop. And that's that's quite interesting to see because, you know, if if we know that area primarily from Liberty, we recognize those same buildings in the background. And it also proves that there must have been some measure of safety doing those sequences because if the kids are up there, uh, <laughs> I would think, you know, any any mother of one of those children would have said, wait a minute, you're going to do what with my children and put them where? Uh, you know, now, now you see, I, I have a terrible fear of heights and always have. Anybody who's been around me for more than two days knows that I freak out on stairways. Uh, so uh, it gets harder and harder for me to watch Liberty, greater, great as it is, uh, as I get older, because I become more and more fragile, you see, and more. <laughs> also, my sense of balance is not as good as it used to be. And so I just say, you know, uh, there's no way I would want to be up there, even if it was supposedly safe. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, thanks to our friend uh, John Benson, uh, he has on his website, uh, he has a, a, a uh, an article on it called Laurel and Hardy's Liberty Rooftop. And John Benson somehow found uh, the uh, the. Um, uh, application of, that the Howard Studios had to fill out in order to construct the girders on top of the building. We can, we can get into that later, but we'll. Yeah, I was I was looking at um, I was looking at John's uh, um, essay the other day, and uh, yeah, he's got a copy of the. Where is he? The, the uh, application to alter, repair, or demolish. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's amazing these all these documents exist, but it's a great record of the yeah. production of the film. I love yeah. it. Absolutely love it. Um, and because uh, he mentions the old wallop and Liberty, uh, it's the Western costume. Yeah, building, well, which right? and, and you know, motion picture studios were intimately familiar with that because that's where they rented uh, most of the uh, the costumes that you see in The Devil's Brother came from that same building. Uh, right. That's why The Devil's Brother actually was not a very expensive movie to make was because they. They borrowed all the costumes from Western costumes, so. <laughs> and and also, uh, it was the same uh, the same location for Richard Dix. Yes. In Day of Reckoning, as well, the a, same, a dramatic the feature, rooftop. right? Yeah, yeah. And there's also, let's see, um, there's a, a Bobby Vernon comedy. Uh, Bobby Vernon was a silent comedian with the Senate, and then later did uh, films for other studios. In 1926, Bobby Vernon made a comedy called Page Me. And according to film buff Stan Taffel, this was shot across the street at another high right. building. And so that way, it, it's it filmed on Broadway with the camera facing the old Western Costumes building. So you can clearly see the top section of the structure that Laurel and Hardy used for their film. So if you want to see the reverse angle, uh, go quickly find a copy of Page Me with Bobby Vernon. There evidently must be one still surviving for Stan Taffel to know about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll definitely look that up because that's it. I find that really interesting that there, from what I've seen so far, there are no kind of stills or images of the of the filming of that uh, of of, of, Liberty, oh, of the of the crew. Um, and it, yeah, it would be lovely to see you know the, the behind the scenes stills for that. Well, that yeah, fantastic. that's something we have to remember. It's not just Laurel and Hardy up there. There's a whole camera crew up there yeah. too. There's yeah. there's George <laughs> Stevens and probably Maury Lightfoot. Uh, who was usually a, a prop man, and uh, very definitely mm. my my dear friend Thomas Benton Roberts was there because he remembered being up there and uh, uh, told me about that. Uh, oh, Ted Driscoll also, and Bones Vreeland, who worked his way up from being prop man to CEO of the Howard Studios in the 1950s. Uh, so yeah, there were there were uh, probably Lloyd French, assistant director. So there was McCary French Stevens, four prop men. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, all up there. And uh, uh, what was it that they said? Uh, uh, Thomas Benton Roberts said to me, he said, uh, uh, we had three stories of supposedly steel structure up on the top of the Western Costume Building. Actually, it was all made out of wood. The roof of the building was 150 feet, and we were working three stories above that. Each time we changed the setup for a shot, we'd have to move the camera platform around and try to miss the flagpole on the corner of the building. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you know, uh, uh, just uh, amazing what they were willing to do for the sake of authenticity. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, I have seen um, there's a great, 
a great, great still from uh, behind the scenes of Harold Lloyd's, uh, which one was it now? Um, look Out Below. Yeah, Look Out Below from 1919. Uh-huh. Um, and I think there's um, Harold uh, is sitting on the on one of the girders, and then you can see Hal Roach standing on one of the on on the sort of oh. side oh, of the boy. girder, and Snub Pollard is also on there uh-huh. as well. Uh, but it just really gives you an idea of what it would have been like on the Liberty side yeah. as well, because you just I haven't seen anything like that for for the. Whole, I think the whole there are some for safety last, but uh, where you can see the whole yeah. structure of it. But uh, I think so, yeah, to, yeah, I think there have is. to look for those because they yeah because they built the sort of facade and the clock and everything was all was all pre made on top of the building yeah it's fa- fantastic it's really how they did it mm-hmm. was just incredible incredible and you think today you know with all the CGI that there'd be nothing like that at all nowadays it'd all be done inside a studio wouldn't it but um, hats off hats off to them. <laughs> 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 Fantastic. Uh, and in terms of, I just wanted to have a little look at um, the supporting cast um, names, because obviously we've got the return of a certain Mister Finlayson, yes. um, who's been away trying to trying to get better work. He, as well, he I think. left the Roach Studio. You know, he there was that period where they were trying to make a starring comic out of him, and it looked like, in fact, if you look at the uh, the the press sheet for the second hundred years. There are a couple of articles which call them a comedy trio of Laurel Hardy and Finlayson. So that would have been interesting for them to be uh, (laughs) not the three stooges, but the three all stars or something. Uh, But that idea sort of fizzled out. And so uh, Finlayson, for most of 27 and through 28, he was working at um, uh, the first national uh, studios and he was making feature comedies, mainly with uh, Dorothy McHale and Jack Mulhall. He, he's in several of those, and I've seen one of them called Ladies' Night in a Turkish Bath, and, and he's very funny and very prominent in it. Uh, so he was getting supporting work in feature films, but he returned to the Roach fold on occasion. I don't think, I, I, after 1927, I don't think he was ever a contract player again, meaning that he was signed to a term contract. I think he was a, a per diem player, meaning signed for uh, whatever particular picture for however many days they needed him. Uh, you know, the Roach studio was con- uh, very cost conscious, and so they didn't need to be paying people uh, every week if they weren't using them. So uh, that's that's what happened with Mr. Finlayson. But yeah, he has a prominent supporting role in what would have been We Fall Down uh, as the uh, uh, music shop proprietor. Now, of course, uh, being someone who loves old 78s, uh, that's also a very... <laughs> gut-wrenching sequence for me uh you know the, as if the skyscraper scenes weren't bad enough uh with my agoraphobia or, or whatever it is now i have to witness all these wonderful old records being smashed to smithereens uh, there are stills which provide enough detail for us to see what the records were and uh, they are prim- they seem to be primarily the uh, columbia uh, green and gold label ethnic series which would be <laughs> Polish or Yiddish records right. or whatever, primarily, or German, Eastern European records primarily. And they would have been considered antiques at the time because they were made right around the time of World War I. And uh, so they were thought, oh, these are 10-year-old records. Who cares about these old things, you know? So, uh, <laughs> and, and those those Trust you those were actually that. quite hard That's to break, great. too, uh, you know, the re- records of that period. Uh, the, the ones that yeah, are, yeah. are easy to break are the ones made right after World War II, because they, they thinned out the shellac mixture. But uh, but actually, records of the teens and 20s don't break that easily. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so there's Mr. Mr. Finlayson making his return. Uh, and we, we have the aforementioned Tom Kennedy. Uh, who is no relation to Edgar Kennedy, although a lot of people think so because they both worked in Max Senate comedies in the mid-teens. But uh, Edgar Kennedy was from Northern California and Tom Kennedy was from New York. And as you can tell from his nose, he too was a boxer, uh, as were many people at the Hell Road Studios were former boxers. And uh, uh, Tom Kennedy had a very lengthy career making films into the 60s, I think. Um, you see him in Three Stooges shorts in the 50s. And uh, he had his own starring series at Columbia for a while. Um, so a very right. prolific actor. And um, he originally was going to be a construction worker. There are stills uh, from Liberty which show him as a construction worker interacting with Laurel and Hardy atop the girders. And That's we need to address that. Uh, uh, that uh, Liberty um, had a, a very lengthy production because um, 
they first of all they did have this sequence from we fought down that was already shot cut ready to go but they had to have the beginning and the ending and uh leo mccary uh, uh shot the uh, initial part of it now how much of mccary's footage wound up in the finished film is open to speculation uh let's see looking at my notes they they shot uh, on location in culver city starting october 1st and by the way, uh, uh, our good friend Chris Bungo, I don't know if have you had him on the show? Ah, no, I'm not well, Chris yet. Bungo no, is no. the king of the then and now location video. He's done a whole bunch of these, which are on YouTube. And if you Google uh, Laurel and Hardy Liberty 1929 filming locations, you'll see Chris's video, which shows all the locations in Culver City. Uh, it doesn't show the, the Western Costume Company uh, building, nor the other primary location, which is the uh, County USC Medical Center uh, uh, for the scenes where there is actual construction going on and you see the elevator coming down to the bottom. Oh, yeah. And it's the scene yeah. where the uh, <laughs> Laurel and Hardy trying to button up their trousers and the two brusque construction workers look at them very <laughs> suspiciously. Well, <laughs> <laughs> There are those moments in Laurel and Hardy films. Uh, that is yeah. the, the County USC Medical Center. And uh, let's see where that was. Anyway, it's still there. And it, it, it took them until 1932 to finish building it. It's just a huge, huge structure. And so that's where that was shot. But uh, anyway, uh, they shot uh, uh, through from October 1st through the 17th, uh, directed by Leo McCary. Uh, and they, so they shot uh, the oh the county hospital on October fifteenth, and the county hospital and West Western costume on October sixteenth, and then Culver City and Western costume on October seventeenth. But then, um, almost a month later, they went back in November, mid November. Obviously, there was something that they didn't like about that sequence. Uh, that originally had Tom mm. Kennedy, and there was also supposed to be a dog involved at some point. Well, we have some stills <laughs> from that early version of it, but they went back uh, November 13th. Uh, they went back and they shot some other uh, things uh, at the Western Costume Company and also some new footage at the county hospital on November 19th. Mm. So uh, that Laurel and Hardy not only went up to that uh, uh, <laughs> constructions or the to the western costume company with the wooden uh, girders placed right there by the studio they not only did that once they went yeah. back a month later and filmed yeah. new material all over again so uh i mean that's real dedication thinking that you finish the film and then a month later they say well no something's not right let's go back and do it again and uh and obviously this had to be one of the more expensive laurel and hardy shorts just because, first of all, yes. it's location shooting, which is always uh, more expensive. And uh, yeah. you've got to get the permit again. Uh, I imagine there's probably a second permit uh, for, for putting the girders back up again, because I'm sure they had dismantled them and said, oh, no, nope, got to do it again. <laughs> God, that must have been a massive and, job, wasn't yes. it? it must, they must have been really ups and, unhappy. And, and the shot. other thing to remember is that that footage, the new footage atop the girders, was not directed by Leo McCary. It was directed by James Horn. So I suspect that mm. a goodly chunk of the high and dizzy footage after Laurel and Hardy go up to the top of the uh, uh, skyscraper was probably James Horn's work and not Leo McCary. So it's interesting. There, there are other instances of that. Uh, uh, Lloyd French is credited as the director of That's My Wife, but the records indicate that most of it was shot by Hal Yates. So that's interesting. And also, uh, Hal Roach directed almost all of Flying Elephants, but one day's worth of retakes were directed by Frank Butler, and Frank Butler got the re uh, the credit. It's very unusual. Hal wasn't the one did his name attached to that one for some reason. Who who could think he what? Prob probably for that reason, he said, Frank, uh, shoot a couple of uh, just a close-up shots of Stan. You know, in the, good, now you're the director. I want no part of that because <laughs> they, they, there were times when Roach was directing something and midway through the production, he'd just throw up his hand and say, I want no part of this. And he'd get the AD and say, you take over. You know, I think, oh, I think great. the, the, you know, the, the boredom that ensues when you're on a movie set where they have to change the lights and spend 30 minutes in between shots. Yeah. That probably got to Roach who was always someone full of energy who wanted to get on with yeah. things. And he, probably had the call of yeah. the polo fields awaiting him or something so <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly isn't that terrible isn't that 
calamitous. So we were talking about the supporting uh, characters. We got to uh, Jimmy Finlayson and uh, uh, Tom Kennedy, who, who, who was rewarded for not getting his role as the construction worker by getting a new role as the prison guard at the very beginning of the film. Uh, and that's another location. That's the old Arnaz Ranch, uh, which we see in many uh, Hal Roach films. Uh, a lot of the R Gang films, they, they have those eucalyptus trees. And uh, uh, of course, at the end of his sequence, uh, Kennedy has his rifle and he he puts it down on the ground and goes off and it prompts a branch to fall on him. And he's struggling with the branches of the eucalyptus trees for his little cameo. Uh, we also have Harry Bernard, whom we love. And see, he's, he's the suspicious fish market proprietor who sees these two men taking down their trousers in the alleyway <laughs> of his store. And that's what prompts the gag with the, the crab falling into Stan's <laughs> trousers, which, by the way, is sort of reworked yeah. in Great Guns. Uh, yeah. with uh, Penelope the Raven, but this time Ollie is the uh, is the victim in that one. But it's yeah. sort of a reworking of the Liberty gag. Of all the insolent stubborn, we're shipping her home tomorrow by Air Express. She'll never stand the altitude. Well, it's up to you to get rid of that bird before the army gets rid of us. What am I going to do with it? Ditch us somewhere quick. Here comes the colonel, the general, and the whole outfit. Hurry up. Quick, pull this gun. All right, hurry up now. Get rid of it. <laughs> What did you want to put that in my pants for? Oh. What was that? Uh, frog in the throat. <coughs> sir. Are you men with Troop D? Yes, sir. We're neighbors of Troop C. They're the swellest bunch. No. Oh. Are you nervous, son? A little, sir. He's a sensitive child. Oh. Now just relax, soldier. I'll try to. Stop! As you were. Does the um does the does the script for for we fall down mention how the crab gets out of the trousers? Ah. Uh. Because obviously it goes up on the girders, doesn't it? Uh, you know, for for liberty. But that's a good question. I wonder if they got that far with it, or if that was something introduced in Liberty. I will have to go back and check. Uh, yeah. You know, I still have my tapes that I dictated at a furious pace back in 1980, and I may have the complete script for We Fall Down. And if I if I do, I'll have to I'll have to th- think about that because. Um, I know they had the taxi cab and they had some of them. I'm not, I'm, I, I wasn't sure if they had Finlayson with the phonograph records, but I think so. I'll have to go back and read the chapter on We Fall Down and uh, see what I said about that 42 years ago. But uh, uh, one of the other uh, 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 prominent members of the supporting cast is Jean Harlow. Uh, and uh, she is the uh, young lady who, with her bow, is about to get into a taxi cab and met by two uh, rather uh, curious passengers who are emerging from the taxi cab. Um, so, and that that might, if, if you want to go into this section of it, that might lead us into the musical score uh, for the film. Uh, well, this this is one of the synchronized Laurel and Hardy films. Uh, let's see the first. Let's see if I can think of them in order. There's uh, Habeas Corpus was the first one, then We Fall Down, then Liberty. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, that's my wife. Um, whatever. There's another. There's a fifth one. Wrong again. Uh, yes, wrong again. And then there's Big Business and Double Whoopie did not have any scores. And then they did uh, uh, Bacon Grabbers and Angora Love. This time only with a pipe organ played by Norbert Ludwig is the name of the organist. Oh yes. On those. I think you mentioned that. Too, yeah. The first time. And yeah, th- those right. were done at the yeah. Trinity Baptist Church on the same wonderful pipe organ that Fats Waller plays in a lot of great jazz pipe organ solo records for Victor. Um, but uh, these scores were were done at the uh, the Liederkranz Hall, which was a concert hall uh, built, let's see, around 1890 or so. And it was on the corner of uh, East 58th Street uh, between Park and Lexington Avenue in New York. Uh, there's a picture of it. That's the big building where they recorded these scores, <laughs> Liederkranz Hall. Gonna... Victor used it for a lot of dance band records all through the late 1920s and in through 1931. 
So Jelly Roll yeah. Morton recorded there and uh, the Rudy Valley and uh, George Olson, even Gloria Swanson uh, made some records there. So it was used very frequently by the Victor Company in the late 20s because it had terrific acoustics. And uh, uh, right. in the, the, that 1929 transitional period, there are trade paper advertisements that MGM placed where they said, we have Laurel and Hardy in silent, synchronized and sound. So they, you know, so whichever way you wanted them, you could get them. Uh, and these were on uh, discs. The soundtracks were on discs. And, you know, none of those were known to survive until the mid 1970s. For some reason, they started to turn up because I remember when uh, unaccustomed as we are, was only available in a silent print. It was never in television syndication because they'd lost the soundtrack discs. And evidently there were no prints made with an optical track or at least none that survived. And around, you know, uh, uh, I, I'm part of the generation of kids that uh, bought films from Blackhawk Films in Davenport, Iowa. Uh, I started when I was nine years old in 1968 and that's where all my lunch money went until I was in my early 20s. It's where everything I... Uh, went to buy Laurel and Hardy films from Blackhawk Films in Iowa on Super 8. And uh, uh, I remember the excitement when the catalog came around 1974. So, you know, you know, unaccustomed as we are now in sound, Laurel and Hardy's first talking film with, you know, real soundtrack because they located a pair of the discs. And then eventually these ones with the music and effects scores also showed up. Well, these were transitional films. They knew talkies were coming but they still had silent films and they wanted to make them a little bit more marketable uh, for people who were clamoring for sound. And so uh, they couldn't give you an actual talking soundtrack, but they could give you a musical score with sound effects that were synchronized. And uh, so that's what, that's what these were. Uh, they were recorded once again at Liederkranz Hall at 111 East 58th Street in New York. Joseph Pasternak was the director, a uh, very distinguished musician, born in Poland and uh, worked a lot for NBC Radio, which was also uh, affiliated with the Radio Corporation of America. Um, and they had 26 men uh, recording this score. Four first violins, one second violin, a viola, cello, string bass, banjo, piano, two saxophones, two clarinets, flute, oboe, bassoon, two trumpets, trombone, two French horns, a tuba, and three trap men who would be percussionists or in many cases, the, the guys providing whatever sound effects there were. And they recorded uh, Reel One, uh, uh, conducted by the assistant director, Alois Reeser, on January 3rd of 1929 uh, in two sessions. Evidently, it took them, I, I, don't, I don't know if they did the whole thing in one pass. I can't imagine that they did, because um, there was a lot of different pieces of music using this. So they did two sessions from 9.30 in the morning to 12.30 p.m., they took an hour for lunch, and then from 1.30 to 4.25, they did the second part of Reel 1. Now, two weeks later, they did the score for Reel 2 <laughs> on, on January 17th. And this time, Joseph Pasternak was conducting 9.30 to 12.30, and just that one session for Reel 2. So uh, it's interesting that uh, there was just as there was a significant gap in the filming, of the uh, high and dizzy sequence when they went back and redid it a month later after they first did it, two weeks later, they take a, a, a try at doing real two of the Liberty score. So this was a very involved production, you know, and, 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 and also I'm sure a, a much more expensive one than, than usual. Uh, I mentioned this score because of Gene Harlow, because there are occasions in this score where they use pop songs of the day. Now they don't do that as much in Liberty as they do for that's my wife or wrong again, or some of the other ones. Those of us who, who know and love music of the 1920s get the jokes because usually the song that they're using, the title of it has some sort of ironic commentary on the visual action in the film. So, uh, or for example, uh, when Ollie in We Fall Down is trying to alibi and you know making up this whole story about not not being with the two girls in the apartment the music is cheating on me uh you know so <laughs> in in uh, in liberty of course during that opening montage there is uh, appropriate music for that so we have hail columbia My Country Tis of Thee. Uh, 
the Battle Hymn of the Republic during the shot of Lincoln. We have over there during the shot of General George Pershing, who was a, a, a general during World War One. And then there's right. the title that says, and even now uh, uh, people are clamoring for liberty and they have the prisoner song. Which is, uh, it was an old pop song, a hit by a guy named Vernon Dahlhart. And uh, in fact, Buster Keaton uses it in Steamboat Bill Jr. during a scene when he's trying to get his dad out of prison. And, uh, and it's a very, it, it, it depends on that song. And it's so, so good organists will always play that song uh, during that scene of Steamboat right. Bill Jr. And it's, oh, if I had the wings of an angel or these prison walls, I would fly. And it's an old, you know, sobbing folk song. So, so that's, <laughs> but uh, during the scene when Ollie is showing the, uh, tr pretending to be a car salesman and showing a, a car to Stan, yes. and you see a, a, a yeah. building in the back that says, join the Culver City Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, the, the, the song they use there is Ain't We Got Fun, which is one that we might still recognize. <laughs> the scene when Gene Harlow is uh, uh, at, at the taxi cab, uh, the song is called Is She My Girlfriend? Is she my girlfriend? Howdy, how dow. Hey, hey, I'm here to say she's my girlfriend now. <laughs> they use that a lot and that's my wife. Um, and let's see, what's another one that they use? Oh, the wobbly walk. Yes. an interesting connection to Laurel and Hardy. Uh, you know, Stan used to do this thing frequently in his solo films where he does this rubber leg thing. And he does that for a <laughs> moment on Liberty when he's trying. Ollie is already at a support girder and Stan is attempting yeah. to, and boy, I really sympathize with Stan at that point where he has to get on his hands and knees and crawl <laughs> because standing up at that altitude yeah. is too frightening. Yeah, well, I, I hear you, pal. <laughs> Uh, anyway, it's a tune. The, the tune was written by Harry Warren, who later wrote, oh, gosh, all the great songs for the Warner Brothers musicals of the early 30s and wrote uh, on the Atchison, Topeka and the Santa Fe and all sorts of songs, primarily for movies during the 30s and 40s. Wobbly Walk was written expressly for a guy named Clifford Red Stanley, who was a trombonist, a singer and an eccentric dancer. An eccentric dancer wasn't quite a tap dancer, but he was limber and uh, comedy dancer, kind of like Ray Bolger, if you remember what Ray Bolger was like. Right. Uh, or if you've ever seen any of the early talkies with Al Rubberlegs Norman, uh, like uh, uh, the uh, <laughs> the Paul Whiteman feature, King of Jazz, he's in that. Uh, he's in Paramount on Parade. He's only The act will only lasts about a minute and 10 seconds, but it's the greatest minute and 10 seconds you ever saw in your life. He's just an incredible dancer. <laughs> anyway, Wobbly Walk was written for the stage show of Irving Aronson's Commanders for Red Stanley to do his specialty. And it's the song that goes, it's a wobbly walk. Well, Aronson's Commanders recorded for the Victor Company, 
but they never got to commercially record this number written for them because those bums, those Waring's Pennsylvanians, which were always stealing their material, <laughs> and they were also on Victor, they got to it first and they recorded it. And so uh, uh-huh. we thought, well, it's lost to history because the only other time they recorded it was for the soundtrack of a, a 1929 MGM Metrotone one reel short. And we don't have the disc. Well, my dear friend, Brian Wright, who runs a company called Rivermont Records, he and I were working on a, a, a complete Irving Aronson CD set. And we thought, what a shame that we don't have that one disc because it would have Wobbly Walk and a couple of others that they didn't record commercially. Well, the late, great Ron Hutchinson, who should still be here with us, located the disc. And it has the one and only recording of Wobbly Walk by the orchestra for whom it was written. And it's the hottest thing they ever recorded. It's just magnificent. So anybody who likes that tune or dance band music in general, Rivermont Records, Irving Aronson, A-A-R-O-N-S-O-N, and Wobbly Walk is the name of the CD. I wrote the booklet notes. And uh, uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's a magnificent performance of that tune. Now, the, the Laurel and Hardy connection is a couple of years after this, Red Stanley married our dear friend Anita Garvin. That's why she is Anita Garvin yes. Stanley, Mrs. Red, on so many of her autographs. And uh, they were married from 1930 until he passed away rather suddenly in 1980. And one of my key regrets is never doing a sit-down interview with him about his work, uh, not only uh, with the Aronson Band, but he subsequently became a film editor at Universal. Uh, one of many musicians who wound up as film editors. That's I, that's kind of an interesting correlation there, but yeah. there are a lot of them. Um, anyway, it was written for Red Stanley, who later became Mr. Anita Garvin. <laughs> So there's that connection uh, previously yet yet to happen at the time that Liberty was made. Now, uh, one one other key thing that you hear in this score, now you also hear I'm sitting on top of the world, which is appropriate for them being on top of the skyscraper. And um, yes. there's one called I'm Flying High at the moment where Stan is swinging on the girder that has suddenly given way. That's a really oh, frightening yes. scene for me. Yeah. And it's and that's good. a tune that it's goes, really da, ba, da, ba, da, ba, ba, I'm Flying High. That's the name of that one. Audiences of the time would have recognized it and would have laughed just at that. But the one and oh, and baby faces yeah, at the yeah. very end when they they come down to the elevator and they squash the policeman and he <laughs> emerges right. as a little person. Uh, baby faces at the very end. <laughs> But there's, there's this one tune you hear all through the pants-changing sequence, which is called Grotesque Elephantine. <laughs> and it's the part that goes... That was written by a man named Lester Brockton. And so thank you, Lester, because that was used to a great effect in the, in that score. And for anybody who really wants to know what each and every piece used in the score and who the composers are, it's in Magic Behind the Movies. I was very happy to be able to track down the composers of all of those pieces. So, so anyway, it's a very effective musical score. It really adds a lot to, to these films. It adds such a lot, as you yeah. say, to, to the film. I mean, I've really been enjoying looking, watching the films again with, with yeah. these proper soundtracks and scores because it just makes so much more 
um, yeah. sense in in a way. And as you say, if you know this, if you know the, I mean, I only know some of the very yeah. very popular tunes. Yeah. That still well, I, I remember, you know, as a kid, I would get my prints from Blackhawk Films, and I would just have a silent projector and run them with no no accompaniment. And you know, for we fought down and also wrong again, I'd kind of think, well, this is a snoozer, you know. <laughs> well, well, you know, well, you know, gotta have them all, okay. Uh, uh, they, they have that very methodical Leo McCary direction where you have a lot of shots where nothing happens at all. That was that's that's the one hallmark of Leo <laughs> McCary. That's why I also think that a lot of early to bed yeah. is Leo McCary because there are a lot of these shots where it's just looking into the camera and you kind of go. And you know, well, something you know, and he he really took the idea of slowing everything down to extremes more so than any other Laurel and Hardy director, I think. So uh, anyway, uh, yeah, it would be it would be interesting to know what what footage McCary uh, did for Liberty that still survives in the film. But credit should be given to James Horn for being the guy who went back up there for round two of all of the skyscraper footage which was five days, five more days of shooting up there on top of the Western Costume Company building. So. Yes, absolutely. And I think James Horn had just, he just signed a contract, I think, with, with Roach at that, at that time. I came okay. across a... Um, well, per, perhaps, he, per, perhaps he was under contract again and not a per diem player. I'd have to uh, look at his filmography and see what other Roach films he made around that time to see if, if, there's, a, if there's a whole block of them, yeah. you know. Yeah, he was in... Um, it was in the film Daily, I think, from September 29th. I was saying that he just, Leo McCary had actually signed him to a new long term okay. contract. Okay. Well, co coincidentally enough, that, hap that, that happens to be the date that the permit was issued. <laughs> for, for September 29th, 1928, was the day that they issued the permit for the Roach Studios to uh, put the wooden girders up on top of the Western Costume Company. Oh, wow. Building. How funny. And let's see, they, they say that the, the set was 24 by 24 feet on roof. Con erect a motion picture set approximately 24 by 24 feet on roof set to rep that's, so that's what they want to do and they get their permit uh signed by somebody whose uh, signature is illegible here but issued they got the permit issued september 29th 1928 so now that's for the first go round. presumably there's another one of these for the second time that they went back a month later in mid-november so <laughs> and that oh by the way that building is now you can now uh, rent an apartment in the Western Costume Company building, which is still there. Uh, if you go to a website called 939 Broadway Lofts, L O F T S dot com slash our dash history. So 939 Broadway Lofts dot com slash our dash history, it will give you the full background on the history of that building and the fact that it has now been converted. If, back in the 80s, it was called the Anjack Fashion Building. Uh, it was still involved in costumes and that sort of thing, even though it was no longer the Western Costume Company building. Uh, but now it's been converted into luxury apartments. And so uh, you, you can now uh, have have a, a lovely lunch or dinner or stay at the Culver Hotel. Uh, that's one Laurel and Hardy location where you can uh, you, you go inside and actually use the building. And now you could actually live at the Liberty location, 939 Broadway in downtown Los Angeles. So what if you get on the roof? Uh, well, uh, I would imagine there's probably whatever the top floor is. You could look up and see where the girders would have been. Uh, I don't know if you could actually yeah, go on yeah. top of the roof. There probably must be emergency access for somebody up there. Uh, I don't know. So somehow the roach crew got up there with all. Can you imagine carrying all the the wood and and how do they get all the platform? It's not like they're just carrying a suitcase up there. They're building all of that stuff up there. How do they get there? Ah, uh, you know. <laughs> I can't make it. Don't weaken now. We've only got a couple more steps. Now both together. <laughs> I mean, you know, having a very, very modest career making films myself, basically for school, for high school and college, it does give you a taste of how the logistics of things really affect what your creative vision is. And that's another reason why going back to my scripts book, that's why that's so fascinating because when you're just sitting with a typewriter in a room, you can come up with all sorts of fabulous things, but then the producer or the, uh, uh, the unit manager goes, okay, how are we going to actually do this? 
<laughs> you you have a scene where they're hoisting a grand piano up to the top of a building. How are we really going to do this? <laughs> you know, what is it going to cost? Uh, how long is it going to take? <laughs> you know, what are the what's the, the the real world imposes itself on your creative vision in in these days before CGI made absolutely everything possible. So, <laughs> do do we know for sure that that, that, that they took that set down? Because obviously, in twenty seven, you know, a couple of years before, just you know, twelve months before, our gang were up there doing the same thing on on wooden looking girders. Yeah. Um, well, I would imagine that yes, they probably were obligated to take it down, and uh, I would think that the Roach Studio probably said, well. You know, the costume company don't doesn't want this unfinished looking building up on top of their building forever. And we can reuse this for something. You know, they were always reusing sets and props. So it probably was dismantled and then put back up again. I wouldn't be at all surprised. Yeah, they must. I mean, they must have been pretty slick at, at the time that uh, Liberty was being constructed, because obviously they'd done it so many times before already. Yeah, well, I would imagine Thomas Benton Roberts uh, was well familiar with all those girders, you know. What I do, what I do like about Liberty is, I mean, mm -hmm. we obviously as soon as you think about Liberty, you think about the high and dizzy stuff. But I do love that trouser swapping thing, that 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 whole. I think it's because of the connotations that the, the, the people who spot them, you can see it in their face, but it's so innocent. And that's what they just get. It's so right. It's so good. Well, you wonder how innocent it was intended to be. I mean, obviously, there are many scenes in silent comedies and even in Laurel and Hardy comedies, which indicate that the makers of these films were wise to the ways of the world. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, I right. mean, if you've ever that's seen right. the Stan Laurel comedy, The Soilers, there's Stan and Jimmy yeah. Finlayson having this really tough cowboy brawl, and all of a sudden this oh, yes. very dainty cowboy prances in with his little flower and prances right out again. And, you know, there were... Uh, yeah. That's Glenn Tryon, you know. I remember Steve Massa told me. That's, that's Glenn Tryon. He's yeah. got a beard on. He's got like a half day growth of beard and the cowboy hat on. I didn't recognize him. Well, you know, there are these moments in Laurel and Hardy films. I mean, there's a couple of them where... You know, there's a they're in bed and a hot water bottle comes <laughs> loose. <laughs> you know, and Mr. Hardy's expressions indicate that he thinks something else is going on. And uh, you know, so yes, there are these moments where, uh, particularly the, the moment when the they're at the base of the of the hospital and uh, uh, the two guys come down in the elevator and Laurel Hardy haven't quite buttoned up yet, and these two guys. One guy looks over his shoulder like, you know, uh-oh, you know, a, a couple of those types, you know, right? So, so and yeah. That's that, lovely, I, that's that lovely bit in, um, oh, is it Angora Love when Kennedy say this is a respectable establishment? <laughs> and then that sailor walks the past sailor and just comes by And he tilted his cap at just the right moment. That was so beautifully choreographed. You have to yeah. wonder if before they shot that, they probably lined up up and, the, and they got the guy playing the sailor and said, okay, right there at that moment, tilt your cat up, cap up, because it's it's too perfect a moment to happen and it happens so quickly. But, you know, it's almost like a ballet. It's it's so beautiful. You know, the, you see the girl and you see the sailor and he goes, like, like, and that, that, that movement, that tilt of the cap indicates that he, he's looking for a good time, you know. <laughs> He's not just yeah, innocent sailor. He's, right. you know, he's he's off he's off base. He's off the ship right now. He's he's at liberty, <laughs> and that's what that that moment. You know, that's a oh, great Lord. thing about pantomime is you can say so much in one little motion like that. Yes, uh, yeah. that's <laughs> right. When that's the great thing about the, these comedies, they they work on different levels as well. You obviously, because kids watching that wouldn't have a clue what the the you know, well they they, were sort of they, they just to. see it on the fact that they they're they're taking their trousers off, but a further implication would not yet be in their consciousness. Uh, so it, yeah, it, it works on several levels, you know, <laughs> and you wonder if after yeah. the implication or implementation of the code in uh, June of 1934, if if that sequence would have been allowed, you know, there are some moments in silent comedies that are, uh, I wouldn't say of questionable taste, but they venture into, let's say, more adult themes. And uh, sometimes some of the, had they even been reissued, they wouldn't have been because they were thought to be obsolete. But, uh, uh, you know, if, if some of these things would have passed muster, but uh, they're still uproariously funny to us. <laughs> some themes are eternal. So even though these films are getting to be 90 odd years old, they're still very contemporary in many definitely, ways. Definitely. Oh, and, that, and that's so, my wife on the dance floor when he's trying to get that necklace out of Stan's dress. Oh, yes. <laughs> or, or, or even better, Garrick and Lucille in the pageant of love. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And you see them wrestling around on the stage. 
<laughs> and he pulls his pulls his petticoat. Yeah, not, yes, not, not, not only is Uncle Bernal shocked, so is most of the actual audience. Uh, oh, uh, so yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's Love kind it. of sad to think that uh, something like uh, Angora Love would have been thought of as obsolete on its re- on its release. Uh, you know, that was shot in uh, in uh, March of 1929. And it's the last silent film issued by MGM. And I think it's the last silent film issued by any major American film company uh, because MGM's last silent feature was what it was, the, the Kiss with Greta Garbo. And that had been a couple of months before uh, Angora Love. So here's this film coming out in December of 1929. Uh, you know, we think of 1930 as being entirely the talkie period, you know, new decade, and we're starting new, and it's a new technology. Um, there actually were a few very low budget westerns that were silenced made in 1930. And that's because a lot of rural theaters in the United States couldn't afford to get themselves wired for sound. They were still running silent pictures. Uh, so there were a few, but for the vast majority of theaters, uh, they would have said a silent movie. We don't run those anymore, you know, in, in December 29. So that one at least did have an organ score with it. So. But yeah, these uh, the the synchronized score uh, films are are wonderful because um, they really put you back into that period. Uh, you know, you're you're really immersed into it with with the ch- the musical choices and the orchestrations. Um, you know, they really make you see a silent film as much as you could experience it at that time. Uh, you know, we always forget that really there were no two screenings of a silent film that were ever alike because musical accompaniment would have changed from one theater to another. If you were at a small town, you would have had a piano. If you were at a bigger town, you would have had a a pipe organist. If you were at a really big town, you would have had an orchestra that would have had something actually scored for the film. But uh, uh, even with an organist, I mean, that's the genius of these people who are theater organists. They're, they know what type of theme they have to play for the sequence because they've seen the film before. But, you know, but whatever they're playing is, is they're composing it as they're playing it. Uh, so, you know, that's something that uh, we, 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 we don't think of. We always think of films as being, you know, this is the final cut. This is it. This is the one, this will be like this forever. Well, maybe the visual component of it was for silent films, but, oh, and then again, there's also the, the A and B negative there's, you know, for every Laurel and Hardy silent, there was a second negative for overseas distribution. And, and there were sometimes significant differences. And now of course, with the deterioration of film elements, Many times now, what you will see is a combination of the A negative and the B negative. Uh, you haven't gone to big business yet. I hope I might be considered to uh, help you with that one. You're on the list, um, definitely. But most most of the uh, most of the prints that you see now have uh, certain shots which are from the uh, B negative, the overseas negative. Uh, now I have a print from 1968, which is a complete domestic negative. And so now when I see the film, uh, I say, oh, no, that's different from my print. Ah, that's different. That's different. You know, so also your darn tootin', there are some shots that are different. And uh, uh, there's there's a shot particularly when when Stan thinks that Ollie has stamped on his hat and he holds it up and he cries. And, and in the domestic negative, he looks right into the camera, right at us. But but in most of the prints you see now, he's looking off to the side. And the reason he's looking off to the side is he's looking into the A camera. But this negative is from the B camera, which is off to a, li- a little bit. Uh, uh, it, it's to the left of the of the other camera. And so Stan's not looking right at us. He's looking a little bit this way. <laughs> I don't, I so don't quite understand. It, why did, why did, for a silent film, why did they need to have a different negative for the film? Because the quality of copying stock was not sufficient. It was too grainy or it just did not give a sufficient pictorial quality. Uh, uh, right. And uh, you know they were very careful right. about that. They wanted the picture to 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 look as good as it could, and so they just um, there is I think an entire um, I think I think for once again Steamboat Bill Jr. I think there are complete prints of both the A and the B uh, negatives, and um, they're different performances in this case. They're not just uh, uh, two different cameras. Um, there, there's a scene where Buster's trying on different hats. And I think it's much longer in the B C a B uh, negative. So, you know, <laughs> you keep as we keep uh, trolling through all of this uh, uh, wonderful old material from getting to be a hundred years ago. Now we keep finding these little surprises. Yes, yeah, they still have their yeah. secrets. I love it. It's fantastic. Uh, right. Well, my my notes are dry, Randy. I don't know if you have anything else left in your uh, in your notes. Uh, I think we've pretty much uh, covered it pretty well. Uh, 
Uh, if, if I if I get another brainstorm, I'll send you an email and say, oh, oh, oh we have to talk about this. I forgot all about that. But uh, anyway, you know, here it is, a, a film that was uh, uh, shot in October, November of 1928. And here we are all these many years. Let's see. What is that now? 90, uh, however many years it is. <laughs> and we're still enjoying it. And uh wondering uh, not not wondering curiously but uh, in a sense of wonder uh, at the the remarkable effort that they put into this uh, you know which was just basically yeah. a supporting film on the program uh, you know those those people yes. yeah. I mean that's the reason why I do what I do is trying to salute these these craftsmen these people who worked so hard uh, to make us laugh uh, then and continuing through all these decades. I mean, the, the quality of their work is, is uh, manifest in the fact that here we are, uh, people all over the world love that film, which was only intended to run for a couple of weeks uh, around the country back in early 1929. And uh, thank goodness it still survives. Yeah, and right. um, some of the people who made it were around to talk about making it. And so uh, we can talk about it now. So Hats off to Liberty. Hats off to Liberty <laughs> and all who I hope someday that. we'll be able to say hats off to hats off. That would be very nice. Oh, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. That would yeah. be fantastic. In the meantime, you can read the cut and continuity in my new book. There, there we go. go. Shameless, there we go. shameless self promotion. <laughs> Coming back full circle. One shameless self promotion. I love it. Yeah. And I will, I will just also thank you as well for your, uh, art, your wonderful article about Marvin T. Hatley that you contributed for the latest um, copy. Yes. I haven't gotten my just copy yet. Here. Oh, yes. I'm, here I'm, it is. I'm awaiting mine. Yes. Yes. It's uh, it all looks absolutely ah uh, good wonderful. Well, it's, I I hope to contribute article. further pieces to this uh, wonderful uh, publication, and uh, uh, congratulations to uh, Russ Babbage on his uh, inaugural uh, issue. Yes, it's, so, he's done yeah. a great job, a really really yeah. great job, and it's lo just, it's lovely just to be part of that legacy because the the magazine has been going for forty four years, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, and just to you know, to let it just disappear, I think would have been a crime. So you know, hats hats off to Russell for keeping that one going as well. So um, if any if any listeners want to subscribe to the magazine, if you haven't already, um, if you just go on to the show notes of the podcast, and um, there is a link there of how you can get hold of your copies uh, of that as well. So, Randy, thank you again once more uh, for for joining us. It's been wonderful to talk to you about Liberty. Um, and um, okay, so yeah, I've got you down for big business. Anything else that you like? Any any other silence that you've got um, you, you'd like to be part of? Oh, I'll have I'll I'll go through the list, and I'll if if, if there are anywhere I think that I've got a particularly good story or two or three on it, I will send you an email and say, oh, oh dibs on this one, dibs on this one, or at least at one of the participants. Let me know. And uh, Let me know. Uh, I I don't know if we I, I guess I mentioned the Chris Bungo uh, uh, video of the then and now locations, at least the ones in Culver City, and uh, J yeah. your your friend John Benson, I know is also going to be talking about liberty and he has an article yes. on his website called laurel and hardy's liberty rooftop so if you google that you'll find that yeah. and once again 939 broadway lofts.com slash our dash history for further reading about the location on which laurel and hardy were clambering during most of the film liberty fantastic well i'll, I'll put links Great. to those in the show notes as well so anybody who wants to, to visit those can just there you go one click and you'll be through fantastic randy all right thank, thank you, you so much sir it's been wonderful and uh, we'll, we will talk to you again very, very soon. All righty. Thank you. Anytime. Take care. Bye-bye. And so that's it. We've braved the heights of episode 26, and we're now back down to earth with a bump. I hope you've enjoyed our deep dive into Liberty. And if it's inspired you to go and watch the film again, then do let me know uh, if we've helped you to appreciate the film in a different way, maybe. Um, in the next episode, just over the horizon, we'll be looking at the boys' 1929 silent short, Wrong Again. So you might like to familiarise yourself with that one while you wait. Don't forget, you can find all my essays about the boys' films at laurelandhardyblog.com, as well as all the podcast show notes, including links to guest websites such as John Bengston's silentlocations.com, and of course links to buy CDs of Bohunk's music, DVDs, Blu-rays, you name it. Huge thanks, as always, to our staggeringly brilliant guests, John Benson and Randy Skretvet. Thank you to the Bohunks Orchestra for their gorgeous music. And we should also take uh, this opportunity to say a special thank you to location detectives such as John Bengston and Bob Satterfield for the tireless devotion given to finding all these filming locations and allowing us fans the chance to feel that bit closer to our heroes. And finally, a massive heartfelt thank you to you for hanging off the girders with me once again. I wouldn't have made it up there in the first place without you. So all that's left to say is goodbye from him. Goodbye!
Goodbye from him. Goodbye. And it's a very goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye.